of the Unexpected by Roald Dahl. Taste, read by Geoffrey Palmer. There were six of us to dinner that night at Mike Scarfield's house in London. Mike and his wife and daughter, my wife and I, and a man called Richard Pratt. Richard Pratt was a famous gourmet. He was president of a small society known as the Epicures, and each month he circulated privately to its members a pamphlet on food and wines. He refused to smoke for fear of harming his palate, and when discussing wine he had a curious, rather droll habit of referring to it as though it were a living being. Um, a prudent wine, he would say, or a good-humoured wine, benevolent and cheerful. I had been to dinner at Mike's twice before when Richard Pratt was there, and as we sat down I remembered that on his previous visits Mike had played a little betting game with him over the claret, challenging him to name its breed and its vintage. Mike had then bet him a case of the wine in question that he could not do it. Pratt had accepted, and had won. Tonight I felt sure that the little game would be played over again, for Mike was quite willing to lose a bet in order to prove that his wine was good enough to be recognised. Mike Schofield was an amiable middle-aged man, but he was a stockbroker. Or to be precise, he was a jobber in the stock market. And like a number of his kind, he seemed to be somewhat embarrassed to find that he had made so much money with so slight a talent. In his heart he knew that he was not really much more than a bookmaker, and he knew that his friends knew it too. So he was seeking now to become a man of culture, and cultivate a literary and aesthetic taste, to collect paintings, music, and all the rest of it. Wine was part of this thing, this culture that he sought. The meal began with white bait and a moselle. Mike was watching Richard Pratt, but he was completely engrossed in conversation with Mike's eighteen-year-old daughter, Louise. As he spoke, he leaned closer and closer to her, seeming in his eagerness almost to impinge upon her, and the poor girl leaned as far as she could away from him, nodding politely, rather desperately, looking not at his face, but at the topmost button of his dinner jacket. We finished our fish, and the maid came forward with the second course. This was a large roast of beef. "'Now,' Mike said, speaking to all of us, but looking at Richard Pratt, "'I must go and fetch the claret, if you'll excuse me.' "'Fetch it, Mike,' I said. "'Where is it?' "'In my study, with the cork out, breathing.' <laughs> "'Why the study?' "'It's the best place in the house. Richard helped me choose it last time he was here.' At the sound of his name... Pratt looked round. "'That's right, isn't it?' Mike said. "'Yes,' Pratt answered. "'That's right.' "'On top of the green filing cabinet in my study,' Mike said. "'That's the place we chose. A good draught-free spot in a room with an even temperature.' He hurried out of the door, to return a minute later holding a wine-basket in which a dark bottle lay. The label was out of sight, facing downwards. "'Now!' "'What about this one, Richard? You'll never name this one, not in a hundred years.' "'Uh, a claret?' Richard Pratt asked, condescending. "'Of course.' "'I assume, then, that it's from one of the smaller vineyards.' "'Maybe it is, Richard, and then again maybe it isn't. "'But it's a good year, one of the great years.' "'Yes, I guarantee that. "'Then it shouldn't be too difficult.' "'Richard Pratt said, looking exceedingly bored. "'Except that, to me, there was something strange about his boredom. "'Between the eyes, a shadow of something evil, "'and in his bearing, an intentness that gave me a faint sense of uneasiness "'as I watched him. "'This one is really rather difficult,' Mike said. "'I won't force you to bet on this one, indeed. "'And why not?' Again, the slow arching of the brows, the cool, intent look. Because it's difficult. I'm perfectly willing to bet, Richard Pratt said. 
All right, then. We'll have the usual, in case of the wine itself. You don't think I'll be able to name it, do you? <laughs> As a matter of fact, and with all due respect, I don't, Mike said. He was making some effort to remain polite, but Pratt was not bothering over much to conceal his contempt for the whole proceeding, and yet, curiously, his next question seemed to betray a certain interest. Would you like to increase the bet? No, Richard. Case is plenty. Would you like to bet fifty cases? <laughs> That'd be silly. Mike stood very still behind his chair at the head of the table, carefully holding the bottle in its ridiculous wicker basket. There was a trace of whiteness around his nostrils now, and his mouth was shut very tight. So, you don't want to increase the bet? "'As far as I'm concerned, old man, I don't give a damn,' Mike said. "'I'll bet you anything you like.' The three women and I sat quietly, watching the two men. "'So, you say I can name the bet?' Pratt asked. "'That's what I said.' There was a pause, while Pratt looked slowly round the table, first at me, then at the three women, each in turn. He appeared to be reminding us— that we were witness to the offer. I noticed the maid standing in the background holding a dish of vegetables, wondering whether to come forward with them or not. "'All right, then,' Pratt said. "'I'll tell you what I want you to bet. I want you to bet me the hand of your daughter in marriage.' Louise Schofield gave a jump. "'Hey!' she cried. "'That's not funny. Look here, Daddy, that's not funny at all.' "'It's ridiculous,' Mike said. "'You said you'd bet anything I liked. "'I meant money.' "'You didn't say money. "'But anyway, if you wish to go back on your offer, "'that's quite all right with me.' "'It's not a question of going back on my offer, old man. "'It's a no bet anyway, because you can't match the stake. "'You yourself don't happen to have a daughter "'to put up against mine in case you lose.' "'And if you had, I wouldn't want to marry her.' "'I'm glad of that, dear,' his wife said. "'I'll put up anything you like,' Pratt announced. "'How about both my houses?' Mike looked over at his daughter. "'You know, Louise, we ought to think about this a bit. "'Stop it, Daddy! I refuse even to listen to you. "'Just wait a moment and hear what I have to say. "'If... Richard loses. He will have to hand over a considerable amount of property. The point is this. He cannot possibly win. Well, he seems to think he can. I know what I'm talking about. The expert, when tasting a claret, so long as it's not one of the famous great wines like Lafitte or Latour, can only get a certain way towards naming the vineyard. He can, of course... "'Tell you the Bordeaux district from which the wine comes, "'whether it is from saint emilion pomerol grave or Medoc, "'but then each district has several communes, little counties, "'and each county has many, many small vineyards. "'It's impossible for a man to differentiate between them all "'by taste and smell alone. "'I don't mind telling you that this is wine from a small vineyard "'that is surrounded by many other small vineyards, "'and he'll never get it. It's impossible.' "'You can't be sure of that,' his daughter said. "'You can't lose. I guarantee it. "'What do you say, Louise? All right?' "'She hesitated. "'Then she gave a helpless little shrug of the shoulders and said, "'Oh, all right, then. "'Just so long as you swear there's no danger of losing. "'Good,' Mike cried. "'That's fine. "'Then it's a bet.' "'Yes,' Richard Pratt said, looking at the girl. "'It's a bet.' Immediately, Mike picked up the wine, tipped the first thimbleful into his own glass, then skipped excitedly around the table, filling up the others. Now everyone was watching Richard Pratt. Slowly he lifted the glass to his nose. He swirled the wine gently around in the glass to receive the bouquet. His concentration was intense. For at least a minute, 
The smelling process continued. Then, without opening his eyes or moving his head, Pratt lowered the glass to his mouth and tipped in almost half the contents. Mmm, he said, putting down the glass, running a pink tongue over his lips. Mmm, yes. A very interesting little wine, gentle and gracious, almost feminine in the aftertaste. There was an excess of saliva in his mouth, and as he spoke, he spat an occasional bright speck of it onto the table. Now we can start to eliminate, he said. You will pardon me for doing this very carefully, but there is much at stake. He looked up at Mike and smiled a wet-lipped smile. Mike did not smile back. First, then, which district in Bordeaux does this wine come from? Oh, that's not too difficult to guess. It is far too light in the body to be either saint Emilion or Grave. It is obviously a Medoc. There's no doubt about that. Now, from which commune in Medoc does it come that also by elimination should not be too difficult to decide? Margo? No, it can't be a Margo. It has not the violent bouquet of a Margo. Poyac? No, it can't be Poyac either. It's too tender, too gentle and wistful for Poyac. Poyac has a character that is almost imperious in its taste. This is a very gentle wine. Demure and bashful in the first taste, emerging shyly but quite graciously in the second, teasing the tongue with a trace, just a trace of tannin. Then in the aftertaste, delightful, consoling and feminine with a certain generous quality that one associates only with the wines of the commune of St. Julien. Unmistakably, this is a St. Julien. He leaned back in his chair held his hands up level with his chest and placed the fingertips carefully together. He was becoming ridiculously pompous. But I thought that some of it was deliberate, simply to mark his host. I found myself waiting rather tensely for him to go on. Louise was lighting a cigarette. Pratt heard the match strike, and he turned to her, flaring suddenly with real anger. Please, he said, please don't do that. It's a disgusting habit to smoke at table. She looked up at him, still holding the burning match in one hand, the big slow eyes settling on his face, resting there a moment, moving away again, slow and contemptuous. She blew out the match, but continued to hold the unlighted cigarette in her fingers. I'm sorry, my dear, Pratt said. But I simply cannot have smoking at table. Now, let me see. This wine is from Bordeaux, from the commune of St. Julien, in the district of Medoc. So far, so good. But now we come to the more difficult part, the name of the vineyard itself. For in St. Julien there are many vineyards, as our host so rightly remarked earlier on. There is often not much difference between the wine of one and the wine of another, but... We shall see. He paused again, closing his eyes. I am trying to establish the growth, he said. If I can do that, it will be half the battle. He picked up his glass and took another small sip. Yes, he said, sucking his lips. It is a fourth growth, I'm sure of it. Good. Now we are closing in. What are the fourth-growth vineyards in the commune of St. Julien? Again he paused, took up his glass. I saw the tongue shoot out, pink and narrow, the tip of it dipping into the wine, withdrawing swiftly again. A repulsive sight. When he lowered the glass, his eyes remained closed, the face concentrated, only the lips moving, sliding over each other like two pieces of wet, spongy rubber. Tannin in the middle taste, yes, of course. Now I have it. The wine comes from one of those small vineyards around Bechevel. I remember now. The Bechevel district. And the river and the little harbour that has silted up so that the wine ships can no longer use it. Bechevel. 
could it actually be a Bechevel itself? Mm, no, I don't think so. Chateau Talbot? Oh, wait a moment. He sipped the wine again, and out of the corner of my eye I noticed Mike Schofield was leaning farther and farther forward over the table, his mouth slightly open, his small eyes fixed upon Richard Pratt. Mm, no, I was wrong. This is not a Talbot. If it is a thirty-four, which I believe it is, then it couldn't be a Talbot. It is not a Bechevel, and it is not a Talbot, and yet it is so close to both of them. He hesitated, and we waited, watching his face. Everyone, even Mike's wife, was watching him now. I heard the maid put down the dish of vegetables on the sideboard behind me, gently, so as not to disturb the silence. "'Ah!' he cried. "'I have it. This is the little chateau Branair du Cru. Mike sat tight, not moving. "'And the year... Nineteen thirty-four. We all looked at Mike, waiting for him to turn the bottle round in its basket and show the label. Is that your final answer? Mike said. Yes, I think so. Well, is it? Or isn't it? Yes, it is. Come on, Daddy, the girl said. "'Turn it round and let's have a peek. I want my two houses.' "'Just a minute,' Mike said. "'Wait. Just a minute.' He was sitting very quiet, bewildered-looking, and his face was becoming puffy and pale, as though all the force was draining slowly out of him. "'Michael!' his wife called sharply from the other end of the table. "'What's the matter? Keep out of this, Margaret, will you please?' "'Daddy!' the daughter cried, agonised. "'Daddy!' "'You don't mean to say he's guessed right. "'Now, stop worrying, my dear,' Mike said. "'There's nothing to worry about.' "'Then he turned to Richard Pratt and said, "'I'll tell you what, Richard. "'I think you and I better slip off into the next room "'and have a little chat.' "'I don't want a little chat,' Pratt said. "'All I want is to see the label on that bottle.' "'He knew he was a winner now.' Then this happened. The maid, the tiny erect figure of the maid, was standing beside Richard Pratt, holding something out in her hand. "'I believe these are yours, sir,' she said. Pratt glanced around, saw the pair of thin, horn-rimmed spectacles she held out to him, and for a moment he hesitated. "'Are they? Well, perhaps they are. I don't know.' "'Yes, sir. They're yours.' She put the spectacles down on the table beside him. Without thanking her, Pratt took them up and slipped them into his top pocket behind the white handkerchief. But the maid didn't go away. She remained standing beside Richard Pratt, and there was something so unusual in her manner that I, for one, found myself watching her with sudden apprehension. "'You left them in Mr. Schofield's study.' she said. Her voice was unnaturally, deliberately polite. On top of the green filing cabinet in his study, sir, when you happened to go in there by yourself before dinner. It took a few moments for the full meaning of her words to penetrate, and in the silence that followed I became aware of Mike and how he was slowly drawing himself up in his chair and the colour coming to his face, and the eyes opening wide, and the curl of the mouth, and the dangerous little patch of whiteness beginning to spread around the area of the nostrils. "'Now, Michael,' his wife said, "'keep calm now, Michael, dear, keep calm!' Lamb to the Slaughter, read by Joanna David. The room was warm and clean, the curtains drawn, the two table lamps alight, hers and the one by the empty chair opposite. On the sideboard behind her, two tall glasses, soda water, whiskey, fresh ice cubes in the thermos bucket. 
Mary Maloney was waiting for her husband to come home from work. Now and again she would glance up at the clock, but without anxiety, merely to please herself with the thought that each minute gone by made it nearer the time when he would come. There was a slow, smiling air about her, and about everything she did. The drop of the head as she bent over her sewing was curiously tranquil. Her skin, for this was her sixth month with child, had acquired a wonderful translucent quality. The mouth was soft, and the eyes with their new placid look seemed larger, darker than before. When the clock said ten minutes to five, she began to listen, and a few moments later, punctually as always, she heard the key turning in the lock. She laid aside her sewing, stood up and went forward to kiss him as he came in. Hello, darling, she said. Hello, he answered. She walked over and made the drinks, a strongish one for him, a weak one for herself, and soon she was back again in her chair, and he in the other opposite, holding the tall glass with both his hands, rocking it so the ice cubes tinkled against the side. For her, this was always a blissful time of day. She knew he didn't want to speak much until the first drink was finished, and she, on her side, was content to sit quietly enjoying his company after the long hours alone in the house. She loved to luxuriate in the presence of this man, and to feel, almost as a sunbather feels the sun, that warm male glow that came out of him to her when they were alone together. Tired, darling? Yes, he said. I'm tired. I think it's a shame, she said, that when a policeman gets to be as senior as you, they keep him walking about on his feet all day long. He didn't answer. Darling, she said, would you like me to get you some cheese? I haven't made any supper because it's Thursday. No, he said. If you're too tired to eat out, she went on, it's still not too late. There's plenty of meat and stuff in the freezer, and you can have it right here, and not even move out of the chair. I don't want it, he said. She moved uneasily in her chair, the large eyes watching his face. But you must have supper. I can easily do it here. Forget it, he said. But darling, you must eat. I'll fix it anyway. She stood up. Sit down, he said. Just for a minute, sit down. It wasn't until then that she began to get frightened. She lowered herself back slowly into the chair, watching him all the time with those large, bewildered eyes. Listen, he said. I got something to tell you. What is it, darling? What's the matter? She noticed there was a little muscle moving near the corner of his left eye. This is going to be a bit of a shock to you, I'm afraid he said. But I've thought about it a good deal, and I've decided the only thing to do is to tell you right away. And he told her. It didn't take long, four or five minutes at most, and she sat very still through it all, watching him with a kind of dazed horror as he went further and further away from her with each word. And I know it's kind of a bad time to be telling you, but there simply wasn't any other way. Her first instinct was not to believe any of it, to reject it all. It occurred to her that perhaps he hadn't even spoken, that she herself had imagined the whole thing. Maybe if she went about her business and acted as though she hadn't been listening, then later, when she sort of woke up again, she might find none of it had ever happened. I'll get the supper, she managed to whisper, and this time he didn't stop her. When she walked across the room, she couldn't feel her feet touching the floor. She couldn't feel anything at all. Everything was automatic now. Down the stairs to the cellar, the deep freeze, the hand inside the cabinet taking hold of the first object it met. She lifted it out and looked at it. A leg of lamb. All right, then. They would have lamb for supper. She carried it upstairs, holding the thin bone end of it with both her hands. And as she went through the living room... She saw him standing over by the window, with his back to her, and she stopped. "'For God's sake,' he said, hearing her but not turning round, "'don't make any supper for me. I'm going out.' 
At that point, Mary Maloney simply walked up behind him, and without any pause, she swung the big frozen leg of lamb high in the air and brought it down as hard as she could on the back of his head. She might just as well have hit him with a steel club. She stepped back a pace, waiting. And the funny thing was that he remained standing there for at least four or five seconds, gently swaying. Then he crashed to the carpet. The violence of the crash, the noise, the small table overturning, helped bring her out of the shock. She came out slowly, feeling cold and surprised, and she stood for a while blinking at the body. All right, she told herself. So I've killed him. It was extraordinary now how clear her mind became all of a sudden. She began thinking very fast. As the wife of a detective, she knew quite well what the penalty would be. She carried the meat into the kitchen, placed it in a pan, turned the oven on high and shoved it inside. Then she washed her hands and ran upstairs to the bedroom. She sat down before the mirror, touched up her lips and face. She tried a smile. It came out rather peculiar. She tried again. Hello, Sam, she said brightly, aloud. The voice sounded peculiar, too. I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes, and I think a can of peas. That was better. She ran downstairs, took her coat, went out the back door, down the garden into the street. It wasn't six o'clock yet, and the lights were still on in the grocery shop. Hello, Sam, she said brightly, smiling at the man behind the counter. Why, good evening, Mrs. Maloney. How are you? I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes, and I think a can of peas. The man turned and reached up behind him on the shelf for the peas. Patrick's decided he's tired and doesn't want to eat out tonight, she told him. We usually go out Thursday, you know, and now he's caught me without any vegetables in the house. How about meat, Mrs. Maloney? No, I've got meat, thanks. I got a nice leg of lamb from the freezer. I don't much like cooking it from frozen. You think it'll be all right? Personally, the grocer said, I don't believe it makes any difference. When she had paid, she put on her brightest smile and said, Thank you, Sam. Good night. And now, she told herself, as she hurried back, all she was doing now, she was returning home to her husband, and he was waiting for his supper. And she must cook it as tasty as possible, because the poor man was tired. That's the way, she told herself. Do everything right and natural. Keep things absolutely natural, and there'll be no need for any acting at all. Therefore, when she entered the kitchen by the back door, she was humming a little tune to herself and smiling. Patrick, she called. How are you, darling? She put the parcel down on the table and went through into the living room. And when she saw him lying there on the floor, it really was rather a shock. All the old love and longing for him welled up inside her, and she ran over to him, knelt down beside him, and began to cry her heart out. It was easy. No acting was necessary. A few minutes later, she got up and went to the phone. She knew the number of the police station, and when the man at the other end answered, she cried to him, Quick, come quick! Patrick's dead! Who's speaking? Mrs. Maloney, Mrs. Patrick Maloney! You mean Patrick Maloney's dead? I think so, she sobbed. He's lying on the floor, and I think he's dead. Be right over, the man said. The car came very quickly, and when she opened the front door, two policemen walked in. She knew them both. She knew nearly all the men at that precinct, and she fell right into Jack Noonan's arms, weeping hysterically. He put her gently into a chair, then went over to join the other one, who was called O'Malley, kneeling by the body. Is he dead? she cried. I'm afraid he is. What happened? Briefly, she told her story about going out to the grocer and coming back to find him on the floor. While she was talking, Noonan discovered a small patch of congealed blood on the dead man's head. He showed it to O'Malley, 
who got up at once and hurried to the phone. Soon other men began to come into the house, first a doctor, then two detectives, one of whom she knew by name. There was a great deal of whispering, and the detectives kept asking her a lot of questions. She told her story again, this time right from the beginning, when Patrick had come in, and he was tired, so he hadn't wanted to go out for supper. She told how she'd put the meat in the oven. It's in there now, cooking! And how she'd slipped out to the grocer for vegetables, and come back to find him lying on the floor. Which grocer? one of the detectives asked. She told him, and he turned and whispered something to the other detective, who immediately went outside into the street. In fifteen minutes he was back, and there was more whispering. Acted quite normal, very cheerful, wanted to give him a good supper. Impossible that she... After a while the doctor departed, and two other men came in and took the corpse away on a stretcher. The two detectives remained, and so did the two policemen. They went about their business, searching the house. Her husband, Jack Noonan told her, had been killed by a blow on the back of the head, administered with a heavy blunt instrument almost certainly a large piece of metal. They were looking for the weapon. The murderer may have taken it with him, but on the other hand, he may have thrown it away or hidden it somewhere on the premises. It's the old story, he said. Get the weapon and you've got the man. The search went on. Sergeant Noonan wandered into the kitchen, came out quickly and said, Look, Mrs. Maloney, you know that oven of yours is still on and the meat's still inside? Oh, dear me, she cried. So it is. I better turn it off for you, hadn't I? Will you do that, Jack? Thank you so much. When the sergeant returned the second time, she looked at him with her large, dark, tearful eyes. Jack Noonan, she said. Yes. Would you do me a small favor, you and these others? We can try, Mrs. Maloney. Well she said. You must be terribly hungry by now, and I know Patrick would never forgive me, God bless his soul, if I allowed you to remain in his house without offering you decent hospitality. Why don't you eat up the lamb that's in the oven? It'll be cooked just right by now. Wouldn't dream of it, Sergeant Noonan said. Please, she begged. Please eat it. Personally, I couldn't touch a thing. Certainly not what's been in the house when he was here. But it's all right for you. It'd be a favor to me if you'd eat it up. Then you can go on with your work again afterwards. There was a good deal of hesitating among the four policemen, but they were clearly hungry, and in the end they were persuaded to go into the kitchen and help themselves. The woman stayed where she was, listening to them through the open door. Have some more, Charlie. No, better not finish it. She wants us to finish it. She said so. Be doing her a favor. Okay, then, give me some more. That's the hell of a big club the guy must have used to hit poor Patrick, one of them was saying. The doc says his skull was smashed all to pieces, just like from a sledgehammer. That's why it ought to be easy to find. Exactly what I say. Whoever done it, they're not going to be carrying a thing like that around with them longer than they need. One of them belched. Personally, I think it's right here on the premises. Probably right under our very noses. What do you think, Jack? And in the other room, Mary Maloney began to giggle. Dip in the Pool Read by Geoffrey Palmer On the morning of the third day, the sea calmed. Even the most delicate passengers emerged from their cabins and crept into the heatless January sun. This sudden calm created a more genial atmosphere over the whole ship. By eight o'clock, the main dining room was filled with people eating and drinking with the assured air of seasoned sailors. The meal was not half over when the passengers became aware that the ship had started rolling again. The movement of the ship became rapidly more violent, and only five or six minutes after the first roll had been noticed, she was swinging heavily from side to side. At last, 
the really bad roll came, and Mr. William Bottibol, sitting at the purser's table, saw his plate sliding away. "'Going to be a dirty night,' the purser said. Most of the passengers continued with their meal. A small number got to their feet and threaded their way between the tables and through the doorway. "'Well,' said the purser, "'there they go.' When the eating was finished— and the coffee had been served, Mr. Martibol stood up and carried his cup of coffee around to a vacant place next to the purser. He seated himself and began to whisper urgently in the purser's ear. "'Excuse me,' he said, "'but could you tell me something?' The purser bent forward to listen. "'What's the trouble, Mr. Martibol?' "'Will the captain already have made his estimate on the day's run? "'You know, for the auction pool?' I mean, before it began to get rough like this. The purser smiled and leaned back in his seat. I should say so, yes, he answered. About how long ago do you think he did it? Sometime this afternoon. Around four o'clock, I should guess. How does the captain decide which number it shall be? The purser looked at the anxious, frowning face of Mr. Bartibol, and he smiled. "'Well, you see, the captain has a conference with the navigating officer. "'They study the weather, and then they make their estimate.' "'Mr. Bartibol nodded, pondering this answer for a moment. "'Then he said, "'Do you think the captain knew there was bad weather coming today? "'I really couldn't tell you, Mr. Bartibol. "'If this gets any worse, it might be worth buying some of the low numbers. "'What do you think?' "'Perhaps it will,' the purser said. The others at the table had become silent, and were trying to hear, watching the purser, with that desperately straining, listening look that comes when you are hearing something straight from the horse's mouth. Now, suppose you were allowed to buy a number. Which one would you choose today? Mr. Bartibol whispered. I don't know what the range is yet, the purser patiently answered. They don't announce the range till the auction starts after dinner. At that point, Mr. Bartibol stood up. "'Excuse me,' he said, and he walked carefully away over the swaying floor. "'The sun deck, please,' he said to the elevator man. The wind caught him full in the face as he stepped out onto the deck. He grabbed hold of the rail and stood looking out over the sea. "'Pretty bad out there, wasn't it, sir?' the elevator man said on the way down. Mr. Bartibol was combing his hair back into place. "'Do you think we've slackened speed on account of the weather?' he asked. "'Oh, yes, sir. we slackened off considerable since this started.' Down in the smoking-room, people were already gathering for the auction. Mr. Bartibol took a chair close to the auctioneer's table. The pool would probably be around $7,000. That was what it had been the last two days. Being a British ship, they did it in pounds, but he liked to do his thinking in his own currency.' Seven thousand dollars was plenty of money. He would get them to pay him in hundred-dollar bills, and he would take it ashore, and right away he would buy a Lincoln convertible. He would drive it home just for the pleasure of seeing Ethel's face. "'Hello, Ethel, honey,' he would say. "'I just thought I'd get you a little present.' The auctioneer was standing up. Uh, "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he shouted, "'the captain has estimated the day's run ending midday tomorrow at 515 miles. As usual, we will take the ten numbers on either side of it to make up the range. And, of course, for those who think the true figure will be still farther away, there'll be low field and high field sold separately as well. Now we'll draw the first number out of the hat. Here we are. 512. The room became quiet. People sat still in their chairs, all eyes watching the auctioneer. There was a certain tension in the air, and as the bids got higher, the tension grew. Number 512 was knocked down for £110. The next three or four numbers fetched roughly the same amount. Lowfield, the auctioneer called out. The next number is Lowfield. Mr. Bartibol sat up very straight. 
He would wait until the others had finished bidding, then he would jump in and make the last bid. He had figured that there must be at least five hundred dollars in his account at the bank. That was about two hundred pounds. This ticket wouldn't fetch more than that. As you all know, the auctioneer was saying, low field covers every number below the smallest number in the range. So, if you think this ship is going to cover less than 505 miles in the 24 hours ending at noon tomorrow, you'd better get in and buy this number. So what am I bid? It went up clear to £130. Others, besides Mr. Bottibol, seemed to have noticed that the weather was rough. 140 50 There it stopped. The auctioneer raised his hammer. Going at 150 60 Mr. Bottibol called, and every face in the room turned and looked at him. 70 80 90 200 Mr. Bottibol called. He wasn't stopping now. There was a pause. Any advance on two hundred pounds? Sit still, he told himself. Hold your breath. No one's going to bid you up. Going for two hundred pounds. Going! Mr. Bottibald held his breath. Going! Gone! The man banged the hammer on the table. Mr. Bottibald wrote out a cheque and handed it to the auctioneer's assistant. Then he settled back in his chair. He did not want to go to bed before he knew how much there was in the pool. They added it up after the last number had been sold, and it came to twenty-one hundred pounds. That was around six thousand dollars. That was enough. He could buy the Lincoln convertible. With this gratifying thought, he went to his cabin. When Mr. Bartibol awoke the next morning, he lay quite still, listening for the sound of the gale, waiting for the roll of the ship. There was no sound of any gale, and the ship was not rolling. He jumped up and peered out of the porthole. The sea was smooth. The ship was moving through it fast. Mr. Bartibol turned away and sat down on the edge of his bunk. He hadn't a hope now. One of the higher numbers was certain to win it. What would Ethel say? It was not possible to tell her he had spent almost all of their two years' savings on a ticket in the ship's pool. There was no point in pretending that he had the slightest chance now. Not unless the ship started to go backwards. Maybe he should ask the captain to do just that. Offer him ten percent of the profits. Mr. Bartibor started to giggle. Then very suddenly he stopped. For it was at this moment that the idea came. Well, he thought, why not? The sea was calm, and he wouldn't have any trouble keeping afloat until they picked him up. The ship would have to stop and lower a boat, and the boat would have to go back to get him, and then it would have to return to the ship. It would knock thirty miles off the day's run. That would do it. Low field would be sure to win, then. Just so long as he made certain someone saw him falling over. And he'd better wear light clothes, something easy to swim in. Sports clothes, that was it. He would dress as though he were going up to play some deck tennis. Just a shirt and a pair of shorts and tennis shoes. What was the time? 9.15. Have to do it soon. The time limit was midday. Mr. Bartibol was frightened and excited when he stepped out onto the sun deck. Nervously, he looked around him. There was only one other person in sight, an elderly woman who was leaning over the rail, staring at the sea. He stood still examining her carefully from a distance. Yes, she would do. She would probably give the alarm just as quickly as anyone else. But wait, there were two possible reasons why she might fail him. Firstly, she might be deaf and blind. All he had to do was check by talking to her beforehand. Secondly, the woman might herself be the owner of one of the high numbers in the pool, and as such would have reason for not wishing to stop the ship. Check on it first. Then... Provided that the woman appeared to be a pleasant human being, the thing was a cinch, and he could leap overboard with a light heart. Mr. Bartibol advanced casually towards the woman, and took up a position beside her, leaning on the rail. "'Hello,' he said. She turned and smiled at him. "'Hello,' she answered. "'Check,' Mr. Bartibol told himself on the first question. "'Tell me.' He said, "'What did you think of the auction last night?' "'Auction?' she said, frowning. "'What auction?' Mr. Bartibald smiled at her and began to edge away. "'Got to go and get my exercise now,' he said. "'It was nice seeing you.' He retreated about ten paces, and the woman let him go without looking around. 
Everything was now in order. The sea was calm, he was lightly dressed for swimming, and there was this pleasant old woman to give the alarm. It was a question now only of whether the ship would be delayed long enough to swing the balance in his favour. He advanced slowly to a position at the rail, about twenty yards away from the woman. He peered over the side of the ship. It was a long drop. He must jump straight and land feet first. The water seemed cold and deep and grey, and it made him shiver to look at it. He climbed up onto the wide, wooden top rail, stood there poised, balancing for three terrifying seconds. Then he leapt up and out as far as he could go, and at the same time he shouted, Help! 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 as he fell. Then he hit the water and went under. When the first shout for help sounded, the woman who was leaning on the rail started up. She looked around quickly and saw this man dressed in white shorts and tennis shoes shouting as he went. For a moment she looked as though she weren't quite sure what she ought to do. She drew back a pace from the rail and swung half around, and for this brief moment she remained motionless, undecided. Then, almost at once, she seemed to relax, and she leaned forward over the rail. Soon a tiny round black head appeared in the foam, an arm raised above it, vigorously waving, and a small faraway voice was heard calling something. The woman leaned still farther over the rail, trying to keep the little bobbing black speck in sight, but soon it was such a long way away that she couldn't even be sure it was there at all. After a while, another woman came out on deck. She spotted the first woman and walked over to her. "'So there you are,' she said. "'I've been searching all over for you.' "'It's very odd,' the first woman said. "'A man dived overboard just now with his clothes on. "'Nonsense!' "'Oh, yes. "'He said he wanted to get some exercise, and he dived in, "'and he didn't even bother to take his clothes off. "'You'd better come down now.' the woman said. And don't you ever go walking about on deck alone like this again. You know quite well you're meant to wait for me. Yes, Maggie, the old woman answered, and allowed herself to be led away across the deck. Such a nice man, she said. He waved to me. Man from the South, read by Tom Hollander. It was getting on towards six o'clock, so I thought I'd buy myself a beer and go out and sit in a deck chair by the swimming pool and have a little evening sun. I went to the bar and got the beer and wandered down the garden towards the pool. It was a fine garden, with lawns and beds of azaleas and tall coconut palms, and the wind was blowing strongly through the tops of the palm trees, making the leaves hiss and crackle as though they were on fire. There were plenty of deck chairs around the swimming pool, and there were white tables and huge brightly coloured umbrellas. In the pool itself there were three or four girls and about a dozen boys, all splashing about and making a lot of noise and throwing a large rubber ball at one another. I stood watching them. The girls were English girls from the hotel. The boys I didn't know about, but they sounded American, and I thought they were probably naval cadets who'd come ashore from the naval training vessel which had arrived in harbour that morning. I went over and sat down under a yellow umbrella where there were four empty seats, and I poured my beer and settled back comfortably with a cigarette. Just then I noticed a small, oldish man walking briskly around the edge of the pool. He had on a large, creamy Panama hat, and he came bouncing along, looking at the people and the chairs. He stopped beside me and smiled. I smiled back. "'Excuse me, please, but may I sit here?' "'Certainly,' I said. "'He sat down and crossed his legs. "'A fine evening,' he said. "'They are all fine evenings here in Jamaica.' "'I couldn't precisely identify the accent, "'but I felt fairly sure he was some sort of a South American. "'Yes,' I said. "'It is wonderful here, isn't it?' 
Suddenly, one of the American cadets was standing in front of us. He was dripping wet from the pool, and one of the English girls was standing there with him. Are these chairs taken? He said. No, I answered. Mind if I sit down? Go ahead. Thanks, he said. He had a towel in his hand, and when he sat down, he unrolled it and produced a packet of cigarettes and a lighter. He offered the cigarettes to the girl, and she refused. Then he offered them to me, and I took one. The little man said, "Thank you, no, but I have a cigar." He pulled out a crocodile case and got himself a cigar. Here, let me give you a light. The American boy held up his lighter. That will not work in this wind. Sure, it'll work. It always works. The little man removed his unlighted cigar from his mouth, cocked his head on one side, and looked at the boy. Always, he said slowly. Sure, it never fails. The little man was still watching the boy. Well, well. So you say this famous lighter it never fails? Is that what you say? Sure, the boy said. That's right. He was about nineteen or twenty, with a long, freckled face and a rather sharp, bird-like nose. He was holding the lighter in his hand, ready to slip the wheel. It never fails. One moment, please. The hand that held the cigar came up high, palm outward, as though it was stopping traffic. Now, just one moment. He kept looking at the boy all the time. Shall we not perhaps make a little bet on that? He smiled at the boy. Sure, I'll bet. The boy said, "Why not?" The little man waved his hand again. Listen to me. Now we have some fun. We go up to my room here in the hotel where there is no wind, and I bet you, you cannot light this famous lighter of yours ten times running without missing once. I'll bet I can. The boy said. I'll make you a very good bet. I am a rich man, and I am sporting man also. Listen to me. Outside the hotel is my car. It's a very fine car. It's an American car from your country, Cadillac. Hey now, wait a minute. The boy leaned back in his deck chair and laughed. I can't put up that sort of property. This is crazy. Not crazy at all. You strike lighter successfully ten times running, and Cadillac is yours. And what do I put up? The little man carefully removed the red band from his still unlighted cigar. Some small thing you can afford to give away, and if you did happen to lose it, you would not feel too bad, right? Such as what? Such as perhaps the little finger on your left hand. My what? The boy stopped grinning. Yes, why not? You win, you take the car, you lose. I take the finger. I don't get it. How do you mean you take the finger? I chop it off. That's a crazy bet. I think I'll just make it a dollar. The little man gave a tiny, contemptuous shrug of the shoulders. Well, 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 he said. I do not understand. You say it lights, but you will not bet. Then we forget it, yes. The boy sat quite still, staring at the bathers in the pool, and I could see that the little man had succeeded in disturbing him with his absurd proposal. What do we do if I lose? Do I have to hold my finger out while you chop it off? Oh no, you might be tempted to refuse to hold it out. Now what I should do? I should tie one of your hands to the table before we started, and I should stand there with a knife ready to go chop. The moment your lighter missed. What year is the Cadillac? The boy asked. Last year is quite a new car, but I see you're not a betting man. Americans never are. The boy paused for just a moment, and he glanced first at the English girl, then at me. Yes, he said sharply. I'll bet you. Good. The little man clapped his hands together quietly once. Fine. He said, "We do it now, and you, sir." He turned to me. "You would perhaps be good enough to, what do you call it, to referee." Well, I said, "I think it's a crazy bet. I don't think I like it very much." 
Nor do I," said the English girl. It was the first time she'd spoken. I think it's a stupid, ridiculous bet. Are you serious about cutting off this boy's finger if he loses? I said. Certainly, I am. Also about giving him Cadillac if he win. Come now, we go to my room. He led the way back through the garden to the hotel. I live in Annex, he said. You like to see the car first? It's just here. He took us to where we could see the front driveway of the hotel, and he stopped and pointed to a sleek, pale green Cadillac parked close by. There she is, the green one. You like? Say, that's a nice car," the boy said. "All right, now we go up and see if you can win her." We followed him into the annex and up one flight of stairs. He unlocked his door, and we all trooped into what was a large, pleasant double bedroom. First, we have a little martini. The drinks were on a small table in the far corner, ready to mix. He began to make the martini, but meanwhile he'd rung the bell, and now there was a knock on the door, and a maid came in. Ah, he said, taking a wallet from his pocket and pulling out a pound note. You will do something for me, please. He gave the maid the pound. You keep that. Now we are going to play a little game, and I want you to go and find for me three things. I want some nails, I want a hammer, and I want a chopping knife. A butcher's chopping knife, which you can get from the kitchen. A chopping knife? The maid opened her eyes wide. You mean a real chopping knife? Yes, of course. You can find these things surely for me. Yes, sir. I'll try, sir. And she went. The little man handed round the martinis. We stood there and sipped them. I didn't know what to make of it all. The man seemed serious about the bed. But what if the boy lost? Then we'd have to rush him to hospital in the Cadillac that he hadn't won. The little man picked up the shaker and refilled our glasses. Before we begin, he said, "I will present to the referee the key of the car." He produced a car key from his pocket and gave it to me. Then the maid came in again. In one hand she carried a small chopper, and in the other a hammer and a bag of nails. Good, you get them all. Now you can go. He waited until the maid had closed the door and then said, "Now we prepare ourselves." And to the boy, "Help me, please, with this table. We carry it out a little." It was the usual kind of hotel writing desk, just a plain rectangular table about four feet by three. They carried it out into the room, away from the wall. And now he said, "A chair." He picked up a chair and placed it beside the table. He was very brisk and very animated, like a person organizing games at a children's party. And now we put in the nails. He fetched the nails and began to hammer them into the table. We stood there holding martinis, watching the little man hammer two nails into the table, about six inches apart. He didn't hammer them right home. He allowed a small part of each one to stick up. Anyone would think he'd done this before. I told myself he never hesitates. And now he said, "All we want is some string." He found some. All right, at last we are ready. Will you please sit here at the table? He said to the boy. The boy sat down. Now place your hand between these two nails. He wound the string around the boy's wrist, then several times around the wide part of the hand. Then he fastened it tight to the nails. When he'd finished, there wasn't any question about the boy being able to take his hand away. Now, please clench the fist, all except for the little finger. You must leave the little finger sticking out, lying on the table. Excellent. Now we are ready. With your right hand, you manipulate the lighter. But one moment, please. He picked up the chopper. We are all ready," he said. "Mr. Referee, you must say to begin." "Are you ready?" I asked the boy. "I'm ready." "And you?" To the little man. "Quite ready," he said, and lifted the chopper up in the air and held it about two feet above the boy's finger. The boy watched it, but he didn't flinch. All right, I said. Go ahead.
the boy said, Will you please count aloud the number of times I light it? Yes, I said. With his thumb he raised the top of the lighter, and again with the thumb he gave the wheel a sharp flick. The flint sparked, and the wick caught fire and burned with a small yellow flame. One, I called. He didn't blow the flame out. He closed the top of the lighter on it, and he waited for perhaps five seconds before opening it again. He flicked the wheel very strongly, and once more there was a small flame burning on the wick. Two. No one else said anything. The boy kept his eyes on the lighter. The little man held the chopper up in the air, and he too was watching the lighter. Three. Four, five, six, seven. Obviously, it was one of those lighters that worked. I took a breath, ready to say eight. The thumb flicked the wheel. The flint sparked. The little flame appeared. Eight, I said. And as I said it, the door opened. We all turned, and we saw a woman standing in the doorway, a small, black-haired woman, rather old, who stood there for about two seconds, then rushed forward, shouting, Carlos! She grabbed his wrist, took the chopper from him, threw it on the bed, took hold of the little man by the lapels of his white suit, hauled him across the room, and pushed him backwards onto one of the beds. I am sorry, the woman said. I am so terribly sorry that this should happen. She spoke almost perfect English. I suppose it is really my fault. For ten minutes I leave him alone, and I come back here, and he is at it again. The boy was untying his hand from the table. He is a menace, the woman said. Down where we live at home, he has taken altogether forty-seven fingers from different people, and he has lost eleven cars. In the end, they threatened to have him put away somewhere. That's why I brought him up here. We were only having a little bet, mumbled the man from the bed. I suppose he bet you a car, the woman said. Yes, the boy answered, a Cadillac. He has no car. It's mine. He hasn't anything left to bet with, the woman said. As a matter of fact, I myself won it all from him a long while ago. It took time. A lot of time, and it was hard work, but I won it all in the end. She looked up at the boy, and she smiled a slow, sad smile. And she came over and put out a hand to take the key from the table. I can see it now, that hand of hers. It had only one finger on it, and a thumb. <laughs> The Way Up to Heaven Read by Patricia Routledge All her life, Mrs. Foster had had an almost pathological fear of missing a train, a plane, a boat, or even a theatre curtain. The mere thought of being late would throw her into a state of nerves. At least half an hour before it was time to leave the house, Mrs. Foster would step out of the elevator, all ready to go, and then, being quite unable to sit down, would flutter and fidget from room to room until her husband, who must have been well aware of her state, finally emerged from his privacy and suggested in a cool, dry voice that perhaps they had better get going had they not. Mr. Eugene Foster, who was nearly seventy years old, lived with his wife in a large house in New York, and they had four servants. On this particular morning, there was a great deal of bustling about. One maid was distributing bundles of dust sheets, while another was draping them over the furniture. The butler was bringing down suitcases and putting them in the hall. Mrs. Foster herself was thinking of nothing except that she was going to miss her plane if her husband didn't get ready. 
"'What time is it, Walker?' she said to the butler. "'It's ten minutes past nine, madam. "'And has the car come? "'Yes, madam. "'I'm just going to put the luggage in now. "'It takes an hour to get to Idlewild, she said. "'My plane leaves at eleven. "'I shall be late.' "'She began walking up and down the hall. "'What time is it, Walker?' "'It's eighteen minutes past, madam. "'Now I really will miss it,' she cried. "'Oh, I wish he would come!' "'This was an important journey for Mrs. Foster. "'She was going alone to Paris to visit her daughter, "'who was married to a Frenchman. "'Mrs. Foster was fond of her daughter, "'and she developed a great yearning "'to set eyes on her three grandchildren. "'She knew them only from the many photographs she'd received.' Lately she'd come to feel that she didn't wish to live out her days in a place where she couldn't be near these children. She knew that her husband would never leave New York and live in Paris. It was a miracle that he'd agreed to let her fly over there alone for six weeks to visit them. Walker, what time is it? Twenty-two minutes past, madam. Mr. Foster came into the hall. Well, he said, I suppose we'd better get going if you want to catch that plane. Yes, dear, yes, the car's waiting. I'll be with you in a moment, he said. I'm just going to wash my hands. Walker, will I miss it, she said. No, madam, the butler said. I think you'll make it all right. Mr. Foster appeared again, and the butler helped him with his coat. Mrs. Foster hurried outside. Her husband came after her. He walked down the steps of the house slowly, pausing halfway to observe the sky. It looks a bit foggy, he said as he sat down beside her in the car. I shouldn't be surprised if the flight's cancelled. Don't say that, dear, please. I arranged everything with the servants, Mr. Foster said. They're all going off today. I told Walker I'd send him a telegram when we wanted them back. Yes, she said, he told me. I'll move into the club tonight. Yes, dear. I'll write to you. I'll call in at the house occasionally to see that everything's all right and to pick up the mail. Will you write to me, she asked. I'll see, he said, but I doubt it. You know, I don't hold with letter writing unless there's something specific to say. They drove on. And as they approached Idlewild, the fog began to thicken and the car had to slow down. Oh, dear, cried Mrs. Foster. I'm sure I'm going to miss it now. Stop fussing, the old man said. It's bound to be cancelled. I don't know why you bothered to come out. She turned away and peered through the window at the fog. Suddenly the driver stopped the car. There, Mr. Foster cried. We're stuck. I knew it. No, sir, the driver said. We made it. This is the airport. Without a word, Mrs. Foster jumped out and hurried through the main entrance. There was a mass of passengers standing around the ticket counters. She pushed her way through and spoke to the clerk. Yes, he said, your flight is temporarily postponed. Please don't go away. We're expecting this weather to clear. She went back to her husband and told him the news. But don't you wait, dear, she said. I won't, he answered. Is the luggage out, driver? Yes, sir. Goodbye, dear, Mrs. Foster said. Goodbye, he answered. Have a good trip. The car drove off, and Mrs. Foster was left alone. The rest of the day was a nightmare. She sat as close to the airline counter as possible and every thirty minutes she would get up and ask the clerk if the situation had changed. It wasn't until six in the evening that the loudspeakers finally announced that the flight had been postponed until eleven o'clock the next morning. Mrs. Foster didn't know what to do when she heard this news. She would have liked to remain just where she was, but she was already exhausted. So she went to a phone and called the house. Her husband, who was on the point of leaving for the club, answered. She told him the news and asked whether the servants were still there. They've all gone, he said. In that case, dear, I'll just get myself a room somewhere for the night. That would be foolish, he said. You've got a large house here. But, dear, there's no food in the house. 
then eat before you come in. Everything you do, you seem to want to make a fuss about it. Yes, she said. I'm sorry. I'll get myself a sandwich here. Outside, the fog had cleared a little, but she didn't arrive back at the house until late. Her husband emerged from his study when he heard her coming in. Well, he said, standing by the study door, how was Paris? We leave at eleven in the morning, she answered. I've ordered a car for the morning, he said. Nine o'clock. Oh, thank you. I hope you're not going to bother to come and see me off. No, he said slowly. I don't think I will. But there's no reason why you shouldn't drop me at the club on your way. She looked at him. The club is downtown. It isn't on the way to the airport. But you'll have plenty of time, my dear. Now I'll see you in the morning at nine. Next morning, Mrs. Foster was up early, and by 8.30 she was downstairs and ready to leave. Shortly after nine, her husband appeared. If you're going to take me to the club first, he said, we'd better get going, hadn't we? Yes, she cried. Oh, yes, please. I'm just going to get a few cigars. I'll be right with you. You get in the car. She turned and went out where the chauffeur was standing. What time is it? she asked him. About 9.15. Mr. Foster came out five minutes later. He paused halfway down the steps to examine the sky. Perhaps you'll be lucky this time, he said as he settled himself beside her in the car. Hurry, please, she said to the chauffeur. I'm late. The man started the engine. Just a moment, Mr. Foster said suddenly. What is it, dear? She saw him searching the pockets of his overcoat. Oh, I had a present I wanted you to take to Ellen, he said. Now where on earth is it? What sort of present? A little box wrapped up in white paper. A little box. A little box, she cried and began hunting frantically in the back of the car. Her husband continued searching through the pockets of his coat. Confound it! he said. I must have left it in my bedroom. I won't be a moment. Oh, please, she cried. We haven't got time. It's only one of those silly combs anyway. You're always giving her combs. And what's wrong with combs, may I ask? Nothing, dear, but, but, but stay here, he commanded. I'm going to get it. Oh, please be quick. She sat still, waiting and waiting. Chauffeur, what time is it? Nearly 9.30. At this point, Mrs. Foster suddenly spotted something white in the crack of the seat where her husband had been sitting. She reached over and pulled out a small paper-wrapped box, and she couldn't help noticing that it was wedged down, as though with the help of a pushing hand. Here it is, she cried. I've found it. She hurried out of the car and up the steps to the front door. She slid the key into the keyhole and was about to turn it and then stopped. Her head came up, and she stood there absolutely motionless, her whole body arrested right in the middle of all this hurry to turn the key and get into the house, and she waited. It seemed as though she was listening for the repetition of some sound that she'd heard a moment before from a place far away inside the house. She remained in that position, about to enter, but not entering, trying instead to hear and to analyse the sounds. Then all at once she sprang to life again. She withdrew the key from the door and came running back down the steps. It's too late, she cried to the chauffeur. I can't wait for him. Hurry now to the airport. Her face had turned absolutely white, and her whole expression had suddenly altered. A peculiar hardness had settled itself upon the features. Isn't your husband travelling with you? the man asked. Certainly not. I was only going to drop him at the club. He'll get a cab. Don't sit there talking. I've got a plane to catch. Mrs. Foster caught her plane with a few minutes to spare, and as the plane flew farther away from New York, a great sense of calmness began to settle upon her. By the time she reached Paris, she was as cool and calm as she could wish. 
She met her grandchildren, and every day she took them for walks and told them stories. Once a week she wrote a letter to her husband, a nice chatty letter, full of news and gossip, which always ended with the words, Be sure to take your meals regularly, although this is something I'm afraid you may not be doing when I'm not with you. When the six weeks were up, everybody was sad that she had to return to America. Everybody, that is, except her. Surprisingly, she didn't seem to mind. Exactly six weeks after she had arrived, she sent a cable to her husband and caught the plane back to New York. Arriving at Idlewild, Mrs. Foster was interested to observe that there was no car to meet her, but she was extremely calm and did not overtip the porter who helped her into a taxi. New York was colder than Paris, and there were lumps of dirty snow lying in the gutters. The taxi drew up before the house, and Mrs. Foster rang the bell. But there was no answer. She rang again, but still no one came. She took out her key and opened the door. The first thing she saw as she entered was a great pile of mail lying on the floor. The place was dark, and there was a curious odour in the air. She walked quickly across the hall and disappeared around the corner to the left. There was something purposeful about this action. She had the air of a woman who was off to investigate a rumour or to confirm a suspicion. And when she returned a few seconds later, there was a glimmer of satisfaction on her face. She paused in the centre of the hall. Then suddenly she turned and went to her husband's study. She found his address book, and after hunting through it, she picked up the phone and dialed a number. Hello, she said. This is 9 East 62nd Street. Could you send someone round as soon as possible, do you think? Yes, it seems to be stuck between the second and third floors. Thank you so much. Goodbye. She replaced the receiver and sat there at her husband's desk, patiently waiting for the man who would be coming soon to repair the lift. Neck, read by Tom Hollander. When about eight years ago old Sir William Turton died and his son Basil inherited the Turton Press as well as the title, I can remember how they started laying bets around Fleet Street as to just how long it would be before some nice young woman managed to persuade the little fellow that she must look after him. That is to say, him and his money. The new Sir Basil Turton was maybe forty years old at the time, a bachelor, a man of mild and simple character, who up to then had shown no interest in anything at all except his collection of modern paintings and sculpture. Naturally, the vultures started gathering at once, and I believe that not only Fleet Street, but very nearly the whole of the city was looking on eagerly as they scrambled for the body. But to everyone's surprise, the little chap proved to be remarkably elusive. Then, round about the beginning of August, the girls declared a sort of truce amongst themselves while they went abroad, and rested, and made fresh plans for the winter kill. This was a mistake, because precisely at that moment, a dazzling creature called Natalia something or other, whom nobody had heard of before, swept in from the continent, took Sir Basil firmly by the wrist, and led him off in a kind of swoon to Caxton Hall, where she married him before anyone else, least of all the bridegroom, realised what was happening. You can imagine that the London ladies were indignant, but we don't have to go into that. In fact, for the purposes of this story, we can skip the next six years, which brings us right up to the present, to an occasion when I myself had the pleasure of meeting her ladyship for the first time. By now, as you must have guessed, she was not only running the whole of the Turton Press, but as a result had become a considerable political force in the country. 
Last Thursday, I went to this small dinner party at a friend's in London, and while we were standing around in the drawing room before the meal, sipping good martinis and talking about the atom bomb and Mr. Bevan, the maid popped her head in to announce the last guest. Lady Turton, she said. Our eyes swung round to the door, waiting for the entrance. She came in fast. Tall and slim, and in a red gold dress with sparkles on it, and my heavens, I must say she was a beauty. The hair was black, and to go with it, she had one of those pale, oval, innocent fifteenth-century Flemish faces, almost exactly a Madonna by Memling or Van Eyck. At least that was the first impression. Later, I got a closer look and saw that, except for the outline and colouring, it wasn't really a Madonna at all. Far, far from it. The nostrils, for example, were very odd, flaring and excessively arched. This gave the whole nose a kind of open, snorting look that had something of the wild animal about it, the mustang. A few minutes later, we went into dinner, and to my surprise, I found myself seated on her ladyship's right. I presumed that our hostess had done this as a kindness to me, thinking I might pick up some material for the special column I write each day in the evening paper. I smiled and made a little bow. She didn't smile back, but started shooting questions at me, rather personal questions: job, age, family, things like that. During this inquisition, it came out, among other things, that I was a lover of painting and sculpture. Then you should come down to the country some time and see my husband's collection. And that was how, on the following Saturday afternoon, I came to be driving down to Wootton with my suitcase in the back of the car. As you know, Wootton is one of the truly great stone houses of the early English Renaissance. Like its sisters, Longleat, Woolerton, and Montacute, it was built in the latter half of the sixteenth century, when for the first time a great man's house could be designed as a comfortable dwelling. Not a castle. As I drove into the forecourt, I noticed with rather a shock that the fountain basin in the middle supported a large statue by Epstein. A lovely thing, mind you, but surely not quite in sympathy with its surroundings. The door was opened by a young footman who led me up to a bedroom on the first floor. Her ladyship, he explained, was resting. Now, in my job, it's necessary to do a lot of weekending, and as a result, I've become fairly sensitive to unfamiliar atmosphere. I can tell good or bad almost by sniffing with my nose the moment I get in the front door, and this one I was in now, I did not like. Later, I was sitting on the bed when softly the door opened and an ancient lopsided gnome in black tails slid into the room. He was the butler, he explained, and his name was Jelks, and he did so hope I was comfortable and had everything I wanted. I told him that I was and had. Her ladyship will be down at seven o'clock. So will Major Haddock and the others. I noticed there was a trace of a sneer around the corners of Jelks's nose. He spoke the words with the outsides of his lips, as though he were nibbling a lemon. Then he slipped out of the door, leaving behind him a certain dampness in the room, and a faint smell of embrocation. Shortly after seven, I found my way to the main drawing room, and Lady Turton, as beautiful as ever, got up to greet me. "I wasn't even sure you were coming," she said. "I am afraid I took you at your word, Lady Turton. I hope it's all right." "Why not?" she said. "There are forty-seven bedrooms in the house." This is my husband. A small man came round the back of her and said, "You know, I am so glad you were able to come." He had a warm smile, and when he took my hand, I felt instantly a touch of friendship in his fingers. And Carmen La Rosa, Lady Turton said. This was a powerfully built woman who looked as though she might have something to do with horses. And this is Jack Haddock. I knew this man slightly. He was a director of companies, whatever that means, and a well-known member of society. I had used his name a few times in my column, but I'd never liked him. And this, I think, was mainly because I have a deep suspicion of all people who carry their military titles back with them into private life, especially majors and colonels. 
I hope you're going to say some nice things about us in your column. He better had, Lady Turton said, or I'll say some nasty ones about him on my front page. I laughed, but Sir Basil drew me gently aside for a quiet chat at the other end of the room. Every now and then, Lady Turton would call her husband to fetch her something, another martini, a cigarette, and he, half rising from his chair, would be forestalled by the watchful Jelks, who fetched it for him. Clearly, Jelks loved his master, and just as clearly, he hated the wife. Each time he did something for her, he drew his lips together so they puckered like a turkey's bottom. At dinner. Our hostess sat her two friends, Haddock and La Rosa, on either side of her. This left Sir Basil and me at the other end of the table, where we were able to talk about painting and sculpture. Of course, it was obvious to me by now that the major was infatuated with her ladyship, and again, although I hate to say it, it seemed as though the La Rosa woman was hunting the same bird. All this foolishness appeared to delight the hostess, but not her husband. I could see that he was conscious of the little scene all the time we were talking, and often his mind would wander from our subject, and he would stop short in mid-sentence, his eyes travelling down to the other end of the table to settle pathetically for a moment on that lovely head, with the black hair, and the curiously flaring nostrils. He must have noticed how exhilarated she was, how the hand that gestured as she spoke rested every now and again on the major's arm. Tomorrow, I said, you must take me round and show me the sculptures you've put up in the garden. Of course, he said, with pleasure. He glanced again at his wife, and his eyes had a sort of supplicating look that was piteous beyond words. He was so mild and passive a man in every way that even now I could see there was no anger in him, no danger, no chance of an explosion. The next morning, as soon as we'd finished breakfast, Sir Basil suggested that we take a long walk around the grounds. I told him nothing would give me more pleasure. He took me everywhere, and I saw it all—the topiary, the pools, the fountains, the parterres, and the rockeries, and of course the sculpture. Most of the contemporary European sculptors were there in bronze, granite, limestone, and wood. Although it was a pleasure to see them glowing in the sun, to me they looked a trifle out of place in these vast formal surroundings. Shall we rest here now for a while? Sir Basil said after we'd walked for more than an hour. So we sat down on a white bench beside a water lily pond and lit cigarettes. We were some way away from the house on a piece of ground that was raised above its surroundings, and from where we sat, the gardens were spread out below. It must be wonderful in summer. Oh, it is. You should come down and see it in May and June. Will you promise to do that? Of course, I said. I'd love to come. And as I spoke, I was watching the figure of a woman dressed in red, moving among the flower beds in the far distance. I saw her cross over a wide lawn, and when she was over the lawn, she turned left. And went along one side of a high wall of clipped yew, until she came to another smaller lawn that was circular and had in its centre a piece of sculpture. This garden is younger than the house, Sir Basil said. It was laid out early in the eighteenth century by a Frenchman called Beaumont, the same fellow who did Levens in Westmoreland. The woman in the red dress had been joined now by a man. And they were standing face to face, about a yard apart, apparently conversing. The man had some small black object in his hand. They turned now towards the piece of sculpture and were pointing at it in a sort of mocking way, apparently laughing and making jokes about its shape. I recognised it as being one of the Henry Moores, done in wood, an object of singular beauty that had two or three holes in it and a number of strange limbs protruding. The black object in the man's hand turned out to be a camera, and now he had stepped back and was taking pictures of the woman beside the Henry Moore. A great wall of yew hid these two people from the house and indeed from all of the rest of the garden except the little hill on which we sat. They had every right to believe they were not overlooked. 
You know I love these yews, Sir Basil said. Have you noticed the different shades of green on the planes and facets of each clipped tree? It's lovely, isn't it? The woman walked around the back of the wood carving, bent down, and poked her head through one of its holes. The man was photographing her. There's another thing about yews, Sir Basil said. In the early summer, when the young shoots come out... At that moment he paused and sat up straighter and leaned slightly forward, and I could sense his whole body suddenly stiffening. The man had taken the photograph, but the woman still had her head through the hole, and now I saw him advance towards her. Then he bent forward so his face was close to hers, touching it, and he held it there while he gave her, I suppose, a few kisses. In the stillness that followed, I fancied I heard a faint faraway tinkle of female laughter coming to us through the sunlight across the garden. "'Shall we go back to the house?' I asked. "'Back to the house?' "'Yes, shall we go back and have a drink before lunch?' "'A drink, yes, yes, we'll have a drink.' But he didn't move. He sat very still, gone far away from me now, staring intently at the two figures. I noticed now that something queer was happening. The woman still had her head through the hole, but she was beginning to wriggle her body from side to side. The man seemed suddenly uneasy. Then I saw him go forward and begin to manipulate the woman's head with his hands. "'She's stuck,' Sir Basil said. "'I suppose we'd better go down and see if we can help.' We came upon them silently, through an archway in the yew hedge, and it was naturally quite a surprise. "'What's the matter here?' Sir Basil asked. He spoke softly, but with a dangerous softness that I'm sure his wife had never heard before. "'She's gone and put her head through the hole, and now she can't get it out,' Major Haddock said. "'Just for a lark, you know.' "'For a what?' "'Basil!' Lady Turton shouted. "'Do something, can't you?' "'Pretty obvious we're going to have to break up this lump of wood.' the Major said. Oh, dear, Sir Basil said. What a terrible pity. My beautiful Henry Moore. At this stage, Lady Turton began abusing her husband in a most unpleasant manner, and there's no knowing how long it would have gone on had not Jelks suddenly appeared out of the shadows. Is there anything I can do, Sir Basil? He kept his voice level, but I didn't think his face was quite straight. When he looked at Lady Turton, there was a little exulting glimmer in his eyes. Yes, Jolks, there is. Go and get me a saw or something so I can cut out a section of this wood. Shall I call one of the men, Sir Basil? William is a good carpenter. No, I'll do it myself. Just get the tools and hurry. While they were waiting for Jelks, I strolled away, because I didn't want to hear any more of the things that Lady Turton was saying to her husband, but I was back in time to see the butler returning. He advanced slowly, carrying a saw in one hand, an axe in the other. He held out both implements in front of him so his master could choose, and I saw the hand that was carrying the axe came forward an extra fraction of an inch towards Sir Basil. It was almost exactly like that card trick where the man says, Take one, whichever one you want, and you always get the one that he means you to have. Sir Basil got the axe. I saw him reach out in a dreamy sort of way, and then the instant he felt the handle in his grasp, he seemed to realise what was required of him, and he sprang to life. For me, after that, it was like the awful moment when you see a child running out into the road and a car is coming and all you can do is shut your eyes tight and wait until the noise tells you it has happened. I didn't open my eyes again until I heard Sir Basil's voice, even softer than usual, calling in gentle protest to the butler. Jelks, he was saying, and I saw him standing there as calm as you please, still holding the axe. Lady Turton's head was there, too, still sticking through the hole, but her face had turned a terrible ashen grey. "'Look here, Jelks,' Sir Basil was saying. "'What on earth are you thinking about?' 
This thing's much too dangerous. Give me the saw. And as he exchanged implements, I noticed for the first time, round the corners of his eyes, the twinkling tiny wrinkles of a smile. Parsons' Pleasure, read by Geoffrey Palmer. Mr. Boggis was driving the car slowly, leaning back comfortably in the seat with one elbow resting on the sill of the open window. How beautiful the countryside is, he thought. How pleasant to see a sign or two of summer once again. The best thing now, he told himself, would be to make for the top of Brill Hill. He could see it about a half a mile ahead. And that must be the village of Brill, that cluster of cottages among the trees right on the very summit. He drove up the hill and stopped the car just short of the summit on the outskirts of the village. Then he got out and looked around. He could see for miles. It was perfect. He could see one medium farmhouse over on the right, with a track leading to it from the road. There was another larger one beyond it. There was a house surrounded by tall elms that looked as though it might be Queen Anne, and there were two likely farms away over on the left. Mr. Boggis drew a rough sketch on his pad showing the position of each so that he'd be able to find them easily when he was down below. Apart from the fact that he was at this moment disguised in the uniform of a clergyman, there was nothing very sinister about Mr. Cyril Boggis. By trade, he was a dealer in antique furniture, with his own shop and showroom in the King's Road, Chelsea. His premises were not large, and generally he didn't do a great deal of business. But because he always bought cheap, very, very cheap, and sold very, very dear, he managed to make quite a tidy little income. During the past few years, Mr. Boggis had achieved considerable fame among his friends in the trade by his ability to produce unusual and often quite rare items with astonishing regularity. Whenever they asked him where he got the stuff, he would smile knowingly and wink and murmur something about a little secret. The idea behind Mr. Boggess's little secret was a simple one, and it had come to him as a result of something that had happened on a certain Sunday afternoon nearly nine years before, while he was driving in the country. The fan belt of his car had broken, causing the engine to overheat and the water to boil away. He'd walked to the nearest house, a smallish farm building, and had asked the woman who answered the door for a jug of water. While he was waiting for her to fetch it, he spotted a large oak armchair of a type that he had only seen once before in his life. Each arm, as well as the panel at the back, was supported by a row of eight beautifully turned spindles. The back panel itself was decorated by an inlay of the most delicate floral design. Good God, he thought, this thing is late fifteenth century. And there, by heavens, was another of them on the other side of the fireplace. Two chairs like that must be worth at least a thousand pounds up in London, and, oh, what beauties they were! When the woman returned, Mr. Boggis introduced himself straight away and asked if she would like to sell her chairs. Oh, dear me, she said, they were definitely not for sale. Uh, but, but just out of curiosity, how much would he give? Or thirty-five pounds? Thirty-five pounds. She'd always thought they were valuable. They were very old. They were very comfortable, too. She couldn't possibly do without them. Well, they weren't really so very old, Mr. Boggis told her. And they wouldn't be at all easy to sell, but it just happened that he had a client who rather liked that sort of thing. Maybe he could go up another two pounds. They bargained for half an hour, and, of course, in the end, Mr. Boggis got the chairs for something less than a twentieth of their value. That evening, 
Mr. Boggis had suddenly been struck by what seemed to him to be a most remarkable idea. If there is good stuff in one farmhouse, then why not in others? Why shouldn't he search for it? Why shouldn't he comb the countryside? He could do it on Sundays. It was the comparatively isolated places, the large farmhouses and the rather dilapidated country mansions that he was looking for. But country folk are a suspicious lot, and so are the impoverished rich. You can't go about expecting them to show you around their houses just for the asking, because they won't do it. How, then, was he to gain admittance? Perhaps it would be best if he didn't let them know he was a dealer at all. He could be the telephone man, the plumber, the gas inspector. He could even be a clergyman. From this point on, the whole scheme began to take on a more practical aspect. Mr. Boggis ordered a large quantity of superior cards on which was engraved the Reverend Cyril Winnington Boggis, President of the Society for the Preservation of Rare Furniture, in association with the Victoria and Albert Museum. Every Sunday he was going to be a nice old parson travelling around compiling an inventory of the treasures that lay hidden in the country homes of England. Now it was another Sunday, and as Mr. Boggis drove down the hill, headed for his first house, the Queen Anne, he began to get the feeling that this was going to be one of his lucky days. He parked the car and got out to walk the rest of the way. He never liked people to see the car until after the deal was completed. A dear old clergyman and a large station wagon somehow never seemed quite right together. Mr. Boggis approached the front door and rang the bell. He heard the sound of footsteps in the hall, and the door opened, and suddenly there stood a gigantic woman dressed in riding breeches. Yes, she asked, looking at him suspiciously. What is it you want? Mr. Boggis raised his hat and handed her his card and explained about the Society for the Preservation of Rare Furniture. This wouldn't by any chance be something to do with the Socialist Party? she asked. From then on, it was easy. A Tory in riding breeches, male or female, was always a sitting duck for Mr. Boggis. He spent two minutes delivering an impassioned eulogy on the extreme right wing of the Conservative Party, then two more denouncing the Socialists. As a clincher, he made particular reference to the bill that the Socialists had once introduced for the abolition of blood sports in the country, and went on to inform his listener that his idea of heaven, though you better not tell the bishop, my dear, was a place where one could hunt the fox, the stag, and the hare with large packs of tireless hounds from morn till night every day of the week, including Sundays. The woman let out a great guffaw of laughter. Come in! she shouted. I don't know what the hell you want, but come on in. Unfortunately, and rather surprisingly, there was nothing of any value in the whole house, and Mr. Boggis, who never wasted time on barren territory, soon made his excuses and took his leave. From now on, it was all farmhouses, and the nearest was situated somewhere back in the fields. In order to keep his car out of sight, Mr. Boggis had to leave it on the road and walk about six hundred yards along a straight track that led directly into the backyard of the farmhouse. There were three men standing in a close group in a corner of the yard, and when they caught sight of Mr. Boggis walking forward in his black suit and parson's collar, they stopped talking, and three faces turned towards him, watching him suspiciously as he approached. The oldest of the three was a stumpy man with small shifty eyes, and although Mr. Boggis didn't know it, his name was Rummins, and he was the owner of the farm. The tall youth beside him was Bert, the son of Rummins. The shortish, fat-faced man was Claude. Claude had dropped in on Rummins in the hope of getting a piece of pork or ham out of him from the pig that had been killed the day before. Claude knew about the killing. The noise of it had carried far across the fields, and he also knew that a man should have a government permit to do that sort of thing and that Rummins didn't have one. "'Good afternoon,' Mr. Boggis said. "'Isn't it a lovely day?' None of the three men moved. At that moment they were all thinking precisely the same thing, that somehow or other this clergyman, who was certainly not the local fellow, had been sent to poke his nose into their business and to report what he found to the government. 
"'Might I inquire if you are the owner?' Mr. Boggis asked, addressing himself to Rummins. "'What is it you want?' Mr. Boggis offered his card. I, "'I just want to look at the furniture to see if you happen to have any treasures, and then I can write about them in our society magazine.' "'You know what I think?' Rummins said, fixing him with his small, wicked eyes. "'I think you're after buying the stuff yourself.' "'Oh, dear me! I only wish I had the money. "'Of course, if I saw something that I took a great fancy to, "'and it wasn't beyond my means, "'I might be tempted to make an offer, but alas, that rarely happens.' "'Well,' Rummin said, "'I don't suppose there's any harm in your taking a look around, "'if that's all you want.' "'They went through the kitchen.' where the only furniture was a cheap deal table with a dead chicken lying on it, and they emerged into a fairly large, exceedingly filthy living room. And there it was. Mr. Boggis saw it at once, and he stopped dead in his tracks and gave a gasp of shock. Then he stood there, staring like an idiot. At this point Mr. Boggis became aware of the three men, Rummins, Bert, and Claude, standing together in a group over by the fireplace, watching him intently. In a flash, Mr. Boggis clapped one hand over his heart, staggered to the nearest chair, and collapsed into it, breathing heavily. "'What's the matter with you?' Claude asked. Oh, "'It's nothing,' he gasped. "'I'll be all right in a minute. Please, a glass of water?' Bert fetched him the water. "'I thought maybe you were looking at something,' Rummin said. "'No, no,' Mr. Boggy said. "'It's uh, just my heart. It happens every now and then.' He must have time to think, he told himself. He was holding one hand over his eyes in a gesture of pain, and now very carefully, secretly, he made a little crack between two of the fingers and peeked through. What he saw was a piece of furniture that any expert would have given almost anything to acquire. Mr. Boggis knew, as does every other dealer in Europe and America, that among the most celebrated and coveted examples of 18th-century English furniture in existence are the three famous pieces known as the Chippendale Commodes. The last one to be sold had fetched 3,900 guineas. And that was in 1921. Today the same piece would surely be worth £10,000. All the experts were agreed that these three commodes could have been executed only by Thomas Chippendale himself. And here, Mr. Boggis kept telling himself, here was the fourth Chippendale commode, and he had found it. He would be rich. He would also be famous. Each of the other three was known through the furniture world by a special name, the Charleston Commode, the first Raynham Commode, the second Raynham Commode. This one would go down in history as the Boggis Commode. It was a most impressive, handsome affair, built in the French Rococo style of Chippendale's Directoire period, a kind of large, fat, chest of drawers set upon four carved and fluted legs that raised it about a foot from the ground. "'How are you feeling now?' Mr. Boggis heard someone say. Oh, uh, uh, "'Thank you. I'm uh, much better already.' A trifle unsteadily, he began to move around the room, examining the furniture one piece at a time, commenting upon it briefly. He could see that apart from the commode it was a very poor lot. "'Now,' This chest of drawers, he walked casually past the Chippendale commode and gave it a little contemptuous flip with his fingers. Worth a few pounds, I dare say, but no more. Rather crude reproduction, I'm afraid, probably made in Victorian times. Did you paint it white? Yes, Rummin said. Bert did it. A very wise move. It's considerably less offensive in white. Oh, that's a strong piece of furniture, Rummin said. Some nice carving on it, too. Machine carved, Mr. Boggis answered superbly, bending down to examine the exquisite craftsmanship. 
You can tell it a mile off. He began to saunter off. Then he checked himself and turned slowly back again. You know what? he said, looking at the commode, speaking so casually that his voice kept trailing off. I've just remembered. Uh, I've been wanting a set of legs, something like that, for a long time. He paused. Now, I was thinking, these legs on your chest of drawers might be very suitable. They could easily be cut off and fixed onto my coffee table. He looked around and saw the three men standing absolutely still, watching him suspiciously. Mr. Boggy shook his head. <laughs> what on earth am I saying? I'm talking as though I owned the piece myself. I do apologise. What you mean to say is you'd like to buy it, Rumin said. <laughs> well, Mr. Boggis glanced back at the commode, frowning. I I'm not sure. No, I think it might be a bit too much trouble. How much were you thinking of offering? Rummins asked. Well, not much, I'm afraid. You see, this is not a genuine antique. It's, it's merely a reproduction. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. Rummins told him. It's been here over twenty years, and before that it was up at the manor house. I bought it there myself at auction when the old squire died. You can't tell me that the thing's new. Well, uh, I mean, it's not exactly new, but it's certainly not more than oh, about sixty years old. It's more than that, Rummins said. Bert, where's that bit of paper you once found at the back of one of them drawers? That old bill. The boy looked vacantly at his father. It was in the back of that drawer underneath all them rabbit snares, Rummins was saying. Bert went forward to the commode. You mean this? He lifted out a piece of folded yellowing paper and carried it over to the father, who unfolded it and held it up close to his face. You can't tell me this right, it ain't bloody old, Rummins said and he held the paper out to Mr. Boggis, whose whole arm was shaking when he took it. The writing was in a long, sloping, copper-plate hand. Edward Montague, Esquire, debtor to Thomas Chippendale. A large mahogany commode table of exceeding fine wood, very rich carved, set upon fluted legs, the whole completely finished in the most exquisite taste, Eighty-seven pounds. Oh, God, it was wonderful. With the invoice, the value had climbed even higher. He tossed the paper contemptuously onto the table and said quietly, That's exactly what I told you. A Victorian reproduction. This is simply the invoice that the seller, the man who made it and passed it off as an antique, gave to his client. I've seen lots of them. You'll notice that he doesn't say he made it himself. That would give the game away. Mm. So what you like, Rummins announced. That's an old piece of paper. Of course it is, dear friend. It's Victorian. Late Victorian. Oh, that was a time when masses of cabinet makers did nothing else but apply themselves to faking the fine furniture of the century before. Listen, parson, Rummins said. How on earth can you be so sure it's a fake? when you haven't even seen what it looks like underneath all that paint. Well, come over here, and I'll show you. Now, anyone got a knife? Claude produced a horn handle pocket knife, and Mr. Boggis opened the smallest blade. Then, working with apparent casualness, but actually with extreme care, he began chipping off the white paint from a very small area on top of the commode. The paint flaked away cleanly from the old hard varnish underneath, and when he'd cleared away about three square inches, he stepped back and said, Now, take a look at that. It was beautiful, a warm little patch of mahogany, glowing like a topaz, rich and dark, with the true colour of its two hundred years. What's wrong with it? Rummins asked. It's processed. Anyone can see that. How can you see it, mister? You tell us. Well, 
I must say that's a trifle difficult to explain. It's chiefly a matter of experience. Well, my experience tells me that without the slightest doubt, this wood has been processed with lime. That's what they use for mahogany to give it that dark, aged colour. Mr. Boggy bent down and pointed to one of the metal drawer handles on the commode. Oh, this is another place where the fakers go to work, he said. Old brass normally has colour and character all of its own. Did you know that? But the trouble is that they've become exceedingly skilled at matching it. In fact, it's almost impossible to tell the difference between genuine old and faked old. I don't mind admitting that it has me guessing. All right, Rummin said. So you admit you can't tell about the handles, hmm? For all you know, they may be hundreds of years old, correct? Ah, Mr. Boggis whispered. That's where you're wrong. Watch this. From his jacket pocket, he took out a small screwdriver. At the same time, although none of them saw him do it, he also took out a little brass screw which he kept well hidden in the palm of his hand. Then he selected one of the screws in the commode and started slowly to unscrew it. If this is a genuine old brass screw from the 18th century, he was saying, you will be able to see quite easily that it has been hand-cut with a file. It was not difficult, as he put his hands over the old screw and drew it out, for Mr. Boggis to substitute the new one hidden in his palm. There you are, he said, handing the modern screw to Rummins. Take a look at that. Notice the exact evenness of the spiral? Ah, it's just a cheap, common little machine-made screw you yourself could buy today in any ironmongers in the country. The screw was handed round from one to the other, each examining it carefully. Even Rummins was impressed now. Mr. Boggis put the screwdriver back in his pocket, together with the fine hand-cut screw that he'd taken from the commode, and then he turned and walked slowly past the three men towards the door. Rummins glanced up from examining the screw. "'You didn't tell us what you were going to offer,' he said. Mr. Boggis looked across at the commode and gave a little scornful wave of the hand. Oh, "'Shall we say <laughs> ten pounds? I think that would be fair.' Ten pounds?' Rummins cried. "'Oh, it's worth more than that for the firewood,' Claude said, disgusted. "'Look here at the bill,' Rummins went on. It tell you exactly what it cost, eighty-seven pounds, and that's when it was new. Now it's antique, it's worth double. <laughs> if you'll pardon me, no, sir, it's not. It's a second-hand reproduction. But I'll tell you what, my friend, I'm being rather reckless. I'll go as high as fifteen pounds. Make it fifty, Rummin said. A delicious little quiver like needles ran all the way down the back of Mr. Boggis's legs. He had it now. It was his. But the habit of buying cheap, acquired by years of practice, was too strong in him to permit him to give in so easily. "'My dear man,' he whispered softly, "'I only want the legs. The rest of it, as your friend so rightly said, is firewood. <laughs> That's all. I'll make you one final offer, twenty pounds.' "'I'll take it,' Rummin snapped. "'It's yours.' "'Oh, dear,' Mr. Boggis said. "'There I go again. "'I should never have started this in the first place. "'You can't back out now, Parson. "'A deal's a deal. "'How are you going to take it?' "'Well, let me see. "'Perhaps if I were to drive my car up into the yard, "'you gentlemen would be kind enough to help me load it.' In a car? This thing will never go in a car. You need a truck for this. No, I don't think so. Anyway, we'll see. My car's on the road. I'll be back in a jiffy. We'll uh, manage it somehow, I'm sure. Mr. Boggis walked out into the yard and through the gate, and then along the track that led across the field towards the road. He found himself giggling quite uncontrollably. Back in the farmhouse, Rummins was saying 
Fancy that old bastard giving twenty pounds for a load of junk like this. What if it won't go in the car? Claude asked. Then he's going to say the hell with it and just drive off without it and you'll never see him again. Nor all the money either. He didn't seem that keen on having it, you know. Rummins paused to consider this new and rather alarming prospect. Claude went on relentlessly. Parson never had a big car anyway. No, I've got an idea. He told us that it was only the legs he was wanting, right? So all we've got to do is cut them off before he comes back. Then it'll be sure to go in the car. Well, it's not such a bad idea at that. Rummin said, looking at the commode. Come on, then. We'll have to hurry. You and Bert carried out into the yard. I'll get the saw. Within a couple of minutes, Claude and Bert had carried the commode outside and had laid it upside down in the yard. Rummins came over from the shed carrying a long saw. Claude took the saw away from him and went to work. Cut him close, Rummin said. Don't forget, he's going to use him on another table. The mahogany was hard and very dry, and as Claude worked, a fine red dust sprayed out from the edge of the saw. One by one, the legs came off, and Bert stooped down and arranged them carefully in a row. Claude stepped back to survey the results of his labour. There was a longish pause. "'Just let me ask you one question, Mr. Rummins,' he said. "'Even now?' Could you put that enormous thing into the back of a car? Not unless it was a van. Correct, Claude cried. And Parsons don't have vans. All they've got usually is piddling little Morris 8s or Austin 7s. Well, the legs is all he wants, Runnin said. If the rest of it won't go in, then he can leave it. He can't complain. Now, you know better than that, Mr. Runnins, Claude said patiently. You know damn well he's going to start knocking the price if he don't get every single bit of this into his car. So why don't we give him his firewood now and be done with it? Where do you keep the axe? Uh, I reckon that's fair enough, Rummin said. Bert, go and fetch the axe. Bert went into the shed and fetched a tall woodcutter's axe and gave it to Claude. Claude spat on the palms of his hands and rubbed them together. Then, with a long-armed, high-swinging action, he began fiercely attacking the legless carcass of the commode. It was hard work, and it took several minutes before he had the whole thing more or less smashed to pieces. "'I'll tell you one thing,' Claude said, straightening up, wiping his brow. "'That was a bloody good carpenter put this job together, and I don't care what the parson says. "'We're just in time!' Rummins called out. Here he comes! Edward the Conqueror Read by Joanna David Louisa stepped out of the kitchen door at the back of the house into the cool October sunshine. Edward! she called. Edward! Lunch is ready! She paused a moment, listening. Then she strolled out onto the lawn and continued across it. She could see him now, about eighty yards away, down in the dip on the edge of the wood, the tallish, narrow figure in khaki slacks and a dark green sweater, working beside a big bonfire. Louisa went down the slope towards her husband. Lunch! she said, approaching. Oh, hello! All right, yes, I'm coming. Oh, Edward, look! Louisa was pointing to the far side of the bonfire. Look! The cat! Sitting on the ground, so close to the fire that the flame seemed actually to be touching it, was a large cat of a most unusual colour. It stayed quite still, with its head on one side and its nose in the air, watching the man and woman with a cool yellow eye. It'll get burnt, Louisa cried, and she darted swiftly in and grabbed it with both hands, whisking it away and putting it on the grass well clear of the flames. Whose is it? she said. You ever seen it before? 
No, damn peculiar colour. For a cat, it certainly had an unusual colour, a pure silvery grey, with no blue in it at all, and the hair was very long and silky. Louisa bent down and stroked its head. Be a good cat now, and go home to where you belong. The man and wife started to stroll back up the hill towards the house. The cat got up and followed them. Go home, the man said. We don't want you. But when they reached the house, it came in with them, and Louisa gave it some milk in the kitchen. During lunch, it hopped up onto the spare chair between them and sat through the meal with its head just above the level of the table, watching the proceedings with those dark yellow eyes which kept moving slowly from the woman to the man and back again. I don't like this cat, Edward said. Oh, I think it's a beautiful cat. I do hope it stays a little while. No, listen to me, Louisa. The creature can't possibly stay here. It's lost. This afternoon you'd better take it to the police. They'll see it gets home. After lunch, Edward returned to his gardening. Louisa, as usual, went to the piano. She was a competent pianist and a genuine music lover, and almost every afternoon she spent an hour or so playing. The cat was now lying on the sofa, and she paused to stroke it as she went by. Her fingers moving over the fur on the cat's head came into contact with a small lump, a little growth just above the right eye. Poor cat, she said. You've got bumps on your beautiful face. You must be getting old. She went over and sat down on the long piano stool, but she didn't immediately start to play. One of her pleasures was to make every day a kind of concert day, with a carefully arranged program, which she worked out in detail before she began. How about some Bach to begin with? Or better still, Vivaldi? The Bach adaptation for organ of the D minor concerto grosso. After that, a touch of Liszt. One of the Petrarch sonnets, the E major, then Schumann, Kindersehnen. She moved herself a little closer to the piano and lifted her hands to the keyboard and began to play. As the first notes of Vivaldi sounded softly in the room, she became aware of a sudden flurry, a flash of movement on the sofa to her right. She stopped playing at once. What is it? she said, turning to the cat. What's the matter? The animal, who a few seconds before had been sleeping peacefully, was now sitting bolt upright on the sofa, very tense, ears and eyes wide open, staring at the piano. Did I frighten you? she asked gently. Perhaps you've never heard music before. No, she told herself. I don't think that's what it is. On second thoughts, it seemed to her that the cat's attitude was not one of fear. If anything, there was a kind of eagerness about the creature. Louisa was watching closely now, and because she was curious to see what would happen a second time, she reached out her hands to the keyboard and began again to play the Vivaldi. This time the cat was ready for it, and all that happened to begin with was a small extra tensing of the body. But as the music swelled and quickened into that first exciting rhythm of the introduction to the fugue, a strange look that amounted almost to ecstasy began to settle upon the creature's face. The ears, which up to then had been pricked up straight, were gradually drawn back. The eyelids drooped. The head went over to one side, and at that moment Louisa could have sworn that the animal was actually appreciating the work. Then she thought, maybe it's a sort of hypnotic reaction, like with snakes. After all, if you can charm a snake with music, why not a cat? Except that millions of cats hear the stuff every day of their lives, on radio and gramophone and piano, and as far as she knew, there'd never yet been a case of one behaving like this. Louisa went straight into Liszt's Petrarch sonnet. And now an extraordinary thing happened. She hadn't played more than three or four bars when the animal's whiskers began perceptibly to twitch. Slowly it drew itself up to an extra height. Then all at once it bounded to the floor and leapt up onto the piano stool beside her. There it sat, listening intently to the lovely sonnet, very erect, the large yellow eyes fixed upon Louisa's fingers. 
Well, she said as she struck the last chord. So you came up to sit beside me, did you? She put out a hand and stroked the cat softly. That was List, she went on. Mind you, he can sometimes be quite horribly vulgar, but in things like this he's really charming. She was beginning to enjoy this odd animal pantomime, so she went straight on into the next item on the programme, Schumann's Kindersehnen. She hadn't been playing for more than a minute or two when she realised that the cat had moved and was now back in its old place on the sofa. It was still staring at her, still apparently attending closely to the music, and yet it seemed that there was not now the same rapturous enthusiasm that had been during the list. In addition, the act of leaving the stool and returning to the sofa appeared in itself to be a mild but positive gesture of disappointment. All right, she said. You seem to like Liszt so much. I'll give you another. Softly, she began to play one of the twelve little pieces from Der Weihnachtsbaum. The cat jumped down, walked around the piano, hopped up on the stool and sat down beside her again. They were in the middle of all this when Edward came in from the garden. Edward! Louisa cried, jumping up. Listen to what's happened. What is it? he said. I'd like some tea. It's the cat! she cried, pointing to it sitting quietly on the piano stool. I thought I told you to take it to the police. But Edward, this cat can appreciate music, and it can understand it too. Nonsense, Louisa. For God's sake, let's have some tea. He sat down in an armchair, took a cigarette from a box beside him, and lit it with an immense patent lighter that stood near the box. What you don't understand, Louisa said, is that something extremely exciting has been happening here, in our own house, something that may even be, well, almost momentous. She was standing by the piano, her pink face pinker than ever, a scarlet rose high up on each cheek. I think, I think it might be possible that we are at this moment sitting in the presence of... She stopped, as though suddenly sensing the absurdity of the thought. In the presence of whom, for heaven's sake? Of Franz Liszt himself. Her husband took a long, slow pull at his cigarette and blew the smoke up at the ceiling. I don't get you, he said. Edward, listen to me. From what I've seen this afternoon, with my own eyes, it really looks as though this might be some sort of reincarnation. You're not ill, are you, Louisa? I'm perfectly all right. I'm a bit confused, I don't mind admitting it. But who wouldn't be after what's just happened? What did happen? if I may ask. Louisa told him, and all the while she was speaking her husband lay sprawled in the chair, a thin, cynical smile on his mouth. I don't see anything very unusual about that, he said. It's been taught tricks, that's all. Don't be so silly, Edward. Every time I play Liszt, he gets all excited and comes running over to sit on the stool beside me. But only for Liszt. And nobody can teach a cat the difference between Liszt and Schumann. You don't even know it yourself, but this one can do it every single time. Twice, the husband said. He's only done it twice. Let's see him do it again. Come on. No, Louisa said. Definitely not. Because if this is List, or anyway the soul of List, then it's certainly not right to put him through a lot of silly, undignified tests. But I'll tell you what I will do. I'll play him a little more of his own music. One thing is certain. As soon as he recognises it, he'll refuse to budge off that stool where he's sitting now. She chose the B minor sonata. She had meant to play only the first part of the work, but once she got started and saw how the cat was sitting there watching her hands with that rapturous, concentrated look, she didn't have the heart to stop. There you are, she said. You can't tell me he wasn't absolutely loving it. He just likes the noise, that's all. He was loving it. Oh, my goodness, if only he could talk. Just think of it. He met Beethoven in his youth. He knew Schubert and Mendelssohn and Schumann and Berlioz. My heavens, 
He was Wagner's father-in-law. Louisa, her husband said sharply, sitting up straight. Tell me something. You don't really believe this, this twaddle you're talking, do you? Of course I do. I don't think there's any question about it now. You know what I think, he said. I think you ought to see a doctor, and damn quick too. With that, he stalked through the French windows back into the garden. Soon, Louisa was in the car driving to town. She parked in front of the library, hurried into the building and headed straight for the reference room. There she began searching the cards for books on two subjects, reincarnation and list. She found something called Recurring Earth Lives by a man called F. Milton Willis. Under list, she found two biographical volumes. She took out all three. Back home, she prepared to do some serious reading. She would begin, she decided, with Mr. F. Milton Willis's work. The Doctrine of Reincarnation, she read, states that spiritual souls pass from higher to higher forms of animals. A man can, for instance, no more be reborn as an animal than an adult can re-become a child. She read this again. But how could he know? How could he be so sure? He couldn't. No one could possibly be certain about a thing like that. Mr. F. Milton Willis was nothing but a guesser. She was not impressed. Louisa now turned to one of the list biographies, and she was glancing through it casually when her husband came in again from the garden. What are you doing now? he asked. Louisa didn't seem to hear him. She was staring open-mouthed at a picture of list in the book that lay on her lap. My God! Look! The warts on his face! I forgot all about them! He had these great warts on his face. The cat has them too. I'll show you. She took the animal onto her lap and began examining its face. Now in the picture, there's one above the right eyebrow. Louisa looked above the right eyebrow of the cat. Yes, it's there, in exactly the same place. And another on the left at the top of the nose. That one's there as well. And one just below it on the cheek, and two fairly close together under the chin on the right side. Edward, come and look. They're exactly the same. It doesn't prove a thing. Louisa turned back to the book and began reading some more. This is interesting, she said. It says here that Liszt loved all of Chopin's work except the scherzo in B-flat minor. Apparently he hated that. He called it the governor's scherzo and said that it ought to be reserved solely for people in that profession. So what? Edward, listen. I'm going to play this scherzo right now and you can stay here and see what happens. And then maybe you will deign to get us some supper. When Louisa began to play, the first effect was as dramatic as ever. The animal jumped as though it had been stung, and it stood motionless for at least a minute. Then it became restless and began to walk back and forth along the length of the sofa. Finally, it hopped down onto the floor, and with its nose and tail held high in the air, it marched slowly, majestically from the room. There! Louisa cried, jumping up and running after it. That! it that really proves it she came back carrying the cat which she put down again on the sofa what about it edward what do you think i must say it was quite amusing amusing my dear edward it's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened oh goodness me she cried picking up the cat again and hugging it to her bosom isn't it marvelous to think we've got franz list staying in the house Louisa, don't get hysterical. And do you know what I'm going to do next? Every musician in the whole world is going to want to meet him, just to see him and touch him and to play their own music to him. So I'm going to invite them to visit him. No, I'm not having it. Not in this house. It'll make us both look perfect fools. Louisa put the cat slowly down on the sofa. Then she took one pace forward. Damn you, Edward, she shouted. 
for the first time in our lives, something really exciting comes along, and you're scared to death of having anything to do with it, because someone may laugh at you. Louisa, he said, that's quite enough of that. Listen, I've been working all day in the garden, and I'm tired and hungry, and I want some supper. So do you. Off you go now to the kitchen, and get both of us something to eat. Louisa stepped back and put both hands to her mouth. Oh, my heavens, she cried. I forgot all about it. He must be absolutely famished. Except for some milk, I haven't given him a thing to eat since he arrived. I must cook him something really special. God damn it, Louisa. Now, Edward, please, I'm going to handle this my way just for once. You stay here, she said, bending down and touching the cat gently with her fingers. I won't be long. Louisa went into the kitchen and stood for a moment, wondering what she might prepare. How about a nice cheese souffle? Yes, that would be rather special. Edward didn't much care for them, but that couldn't be helped. She was only a fair cook, and she couldn't be sure of always having a souffle come out well. But she took extra trouble this time, and waited a long while to make certain the oven had heated to the correct temperature. When it was ready... She put it on a tray and carried it into the living room. At the exact moment she entered, she saw her husband coming in through the French windows from the garden. Here's his supper, she said, putting it on the table and turning towards the sofa. Where is he? Her husband closed the garden door behind him and walked across the room to get himself a cigarette. Edward, where is he? Who? You know who? Ah, yes. Well, I'll tell you. He was bending forward to light the cigarette, and his hands were cupped around the lighter. He glanced up and saw Louisa looking at him, at his shoes, at the bottoms of his khaki slacks, which were damp from walking in long grass. I just went out to see how the bonfire was going, he said. Her eyes travelled slowly upwards and rested on his hands. It's still burning fine, he went on. I think it'll keep going all night. But the way she was staring made him uncomfortable. What is it? he said, lowering the lighter. Then he looked down and noticed for the first time the long, thin scratch that ran diagonally clear across the back of one hand from the knuckle to the wrist. Edward! Yes, he said. Those brambles are terrible. They tear you to pieces. Edward! For God's sake, woman, sit down and keep calm. There's nothing to get worked up about. Louisa! Louisa! Sit down! Nunc Dimittis, read by Geoffrey Palmer. It is nearly midnight, and I can see that if I don't make a start with writing this story now, I never shall. My idea, and I believe it was a good one, was to try, by a process of confession and analysis, to discover a reason, or at any rate some justification, for my outrageous behaviour towards Janet de Pelagia. If I'm to be quite honest with myself, I suppose I shall have to admit that what is disturbing me most is the knowledge that I have made a monstrous fool of myself, and that all my friends must now be regarding me as nothing but a vicious, vengeful old man. Yes, and that surely hurts. When I say to you that my friends were my whole life, then perhaps you will begin to understand. Will you? I doubt it, unless I digress for a minute to tell you roughly the sort of person I am. I suppose I am a type. A rare one, mark you, but nevertheless a quite definite type. The wealthy, leisurely, middle-aged man of culture. Adored 
I choose the word carefully, by his many friends for his charm, his money, his air of scholarship, his generosity, and I sincerely hope for himself. He is invariably a bachelor, yet he never appears to get entangled with the women who surround him, who love him so dearly. I don't think I need say more. You should know me well enough by now to judge me fairly, and dare I hope it, to sympathise with me when you hear my story. You may even decide that much of the blame for what has happened should be placed not upon me, but upon a lady called Gladys Punsonby. After all, it was she who started it. Had I not escorted Gladys Punsonby back to her house that night nearly six months ago, and had she not spoken so freely to me about certain people and certain things, then this tragic business could never have taken place. We had been dining with the Ashendons, and when it was time to go, I offered to see her safely back to her house. She accepted, and we left together in my car. But unfortunately, when we arrived at her place, she insisted that I come in and have one for the road. I didn't wish to be stuffy, so I told the chauffeur to wait, and followed her in. Gladys Punsonby is a widow, a few years younger than me, maybe fifty-three or four, and it is possible that thirty years ago she was quite a fetching little thing, but now the face is loose and puckered, with nothing distinctive about it whatsoever. The individual features, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the chin, are buried in the folds of fat around the puckered little face, and one does not notice them, except perhaps the mouth, which reminds me— I cannot help it, of a salmon. In the living room, as she gave me my brandy, I noticed that her hand was a trifle unsteady. The lady is tired, I told myself, so I mustn't stay long. We sat down together on the sofa and for a while discussed the Ashenden's party and the people who were there. Finally, I got up to go. Lionel, tell me what you think of my new portrait. She indicated a large canvas hanging over the fireplace that I had been trying to avoid with my eye ever since I entered the room. It was a hideous thing. Painted, as I well knew, by a man who was now all the rage in London, a very mediocre painter called John Royden. It was a full-length portrait of Gladys, Lady Punsonby, painted with a certain technical cunning that made her out to be a quite alluring creature. "'Charming,' I said. "'Listen, Lionel, John Royden is so sought after now "'that he won't even consider painting anyone for less than a thousand guineas.' "'Really? Oh, yes, and everyone's queuing up, "'simply queuing up to get themselves done. Mm, "'Most interesting.' "'She sat silent for a while, sipping her brandy, and I couldn't help noticing how the unsteadiness of her hand was causing the rim of the glass to jog against her lower lip. She knew I was watching her, and without turning her head she swivelled her eyes and glanced at me cautiously. A pen of your thoughts? Now, if there is one phrase in the world I cannot abide, it is this. It gives me an actual physical pain in the chest, and I began to cough. Come on, Lionel, a penny for them. I shook my head being quite unable to answer. She turned away abruptly, and placed the brandy-glass on a small table to her left, and the manner in which she did this seemed to suggest that she felt rebuffed, and was now clearing the decks for action. I waited, rather uncomfortably in the silence that followed, and because I had no conversation left in me, I made a great play about smoking my cigar, studying the ash intently and blowing the smoke slowly towards the ceiling. There was beginning to be something about this lady that I did not like, a mischievous brooding air that made me want to get up quickly and go away. When she looked around again, she was smiling at me slyly with those little buried eyes of hers, but the mouth, just like a salmon's, was absolutely rigid. "'Lionel, I think I'll tell you a secret. "'I'm not very good at secrets. "'I suppose you know that John Royden paints only women. "'I didn't. "'And they're always full-length portraits, "'either standing or sitting, like mine here. "'Now, take a good look at it, Lionel. 
Do you see how beautifully the dress is painted? Well, go over and look carefully, please. I got up reluctantly and went over and examined the painting. To my surprise, I noticed that the paint of the dress was laid on so heavily it was actually raised out from the rest of the picture. It was a trick, quite effective in its way, but neither difficult to do nor entirely original. You see, she said, it's thick, isn't it? Where the dress is? Yes. But there's a bit more to it than that, you know, Lionel. I think the best way is to describe what happened the very first time I went along for a sitting. Oh, what a bore this woman is, I thought, and how can I get away? That was about a year ago. Mr. Royden sat me down, gave me a drink, and came straight to the point. He told me about how he painted quite differently from other artists. In his opinion, he said, there was only one method of attaining perfection when painting a woman's body, and I mustn't be shocked when I heard what it was. You see, he went on, you examine any painting you like of a woman, I don't care who it's by, and you'll see that although the dress may be well painted, there is an effect of flatness about the whole thing, as though the dress were draped over a log of wood because the painters themselves didn't really know what was underneath. Gladys Punsonby paused to take a few more sips of brandy. Don't look so startled, Lionel, she said to me. There's nothing wrong about this. So then Mr. Royden said, That's why I insist on painting my subjects, first of all, in the nude. <laughs> "'Good heavens, Mr. Royden!' I exclaimed. "'And when I've done you like that,' he went on, "'we'll have to wait a few weeks for the paint to dry. "'Then I paint you in your underclothing, "'and when that's dry, I paint on the dress. "'You see, it's quite simple.' "'The man's an absolute bounder!' I cried. Oh, "'Don't be silly, Lionel. "'Anyway, let me finish.' The first thing I told him was that my husband, who was alive then, would never agree. Your husband need never know, he answered. Why trouble him? No one knows my secret except the woman I've painted. And when I protested a bit more, he said, My dear Lady Punsonby, there's nothing immoral about this. Art is only immoral when practised by amateurs. It's the same with medicine. You wouldn't refuse to undress before your doctor, would you? <laughs> I told him I would if I'd gone to him for earache. <laughs> that made him laugh. <laughs> but he kept on at me about it, and I must say he was very convincing. So after a while I gave in, and that was that. She got up and went over to fetch herself some more brandy. Gladys, is this really true? Of course it's true. You mean to say, that's the way he paints all his subjects? Yes. And the joke is, the husbands never know anything about it. All they see is a nice, fully clothed portrait of their wives. Listen, Gladys, I want you to tell me something. Did you by any chance know about this, this peculiar technique of Royden's before you went to him? When I asked the question, she was pouring the brandy, and she hesitated, a little silky smile moving the corners of her mouth. "'Damn you, Lionel,' she said. "'You're far too clever. You never let me get away with a thing. So you knew?' "'Of course. Hermione Girdleston told me. "'There's still nothing wrong.' "'Nothing,' I said. Absolutely nothing. I could see it all quite clearly now. This Royden was indeed a bounder, practising as neat a piece of psychological trickery as ever I'd seen. The man knew only too well that there was a whole set of wealthy, indolent women in the city who got up at noon and spent the rest of the day trying to relieve their boredom with bridge and shopping until the cocktail hour came along why the news of an entertainment like this would spread through their ranks like smallpox. "'You won't tell anyone, Lionel, will you?' "'No, 
course not. But now I must go, Gladys, I really must. Don't be so silly. I'm just beginning to enjoy myself. Stay till I've finished this drink, anyway. I sat patiently on the sofa while she went on with her interminable brandy sipping. The little buried eyes were still watching me out of their corners in that mischievous, canny way, and I had a strong feeling that the woman was now hatching out some further unpleasantness or scandal. Then, suddenly, so suddenly that I jumped, she said, "'Lionel, what's this I hear about you and Janet de Pelagia? "'Now, Gladys, please, Lionel, you're blushing. "'Nonsense!' "'Don't tell me the old bachelor has really taken a tumble at last. "'Janet is a fine girl. <laughs> "'You can hardly call her a girl.' "'Gladys Ponsonby paused, "'staring down into the large brandy glass "'that she held cupped in both hands. "'But, of course, I agree with you, Lionel. "'She's a wonderful person in every way, "'except—' and now she spoke very slowly, except that she does say some rather peculiar things occasionally. What sort of things? Just things, you know, things about people, about you. What did she say about me? Well, now, let me see. <laughs> of course, she was only joking, or I couldn't dream of telling you, but I suppose she did say how it was all a wee bit of a bore. What was? Well, sort of going out to dinner with you nearly every night, that kind of thing. She said it was a bore? Yes. Gladys Punsonby drained the brandy glass with one last big gulp, and sitting upright on the sofa began cleverly to mimic the deep tone of that voice I knew so well. Such a bore, my dear, because with Lionel one can always tell exactly what will happen for dinner we'll go to the Savoy Grill, always the Savoy Grill. Then in the taxi home he'll start burbling about how he wished he was just twenty years younger, and... Then at the front door, while I fish for my key, he'll stand beside me with a sort of silly spaniel look in his eyes, and I'll slowly put the key in the lock and slowly turn it, and then, very quickly, before he has time to move, I'll say good night and skip inside and shut the door behind me. <laughs> Why, Lionel, what's the matter, dear? You look positively ill. At that point... Mercifully, I must have swooned clear away. I can remember practically nothing of the rest of that terrible night except for a vague and disturbing suspicion that when I regained consciousness, I broke down completely and permitted Gladys Punsonby to comfort me in a variety of different ways. Later, I believe I walked out of the house and was driven home, but I remained more or less unconscious of everything about me until I woke up in my bed the following morning. I can remember with what terrifying swiftness my hatred of Janet de Pelagia began to grow. It all happened in a few minutes, a sudden, violent welling up of hatred. I tried to dismiss it, but it was on me like a fever, and in no time at all I was hunting around as would some filthy gangster for a method of revenge. A curious way to behave, you may say, for a man such as me. To which I would answer, no, not really, if you consider the circumstances. To my mind, this was the sort of thing that could drive a man to murder. As a matter of fact, had it not been for a small sadistic streak that caused me to seek a more subtle and painful punishment for my victim, I might well have become a murderer myself. But mere killing, I decided, was too good for this woman, and far too crude for my taste— so I began looking for a superior alternative. Fury and hate can concentrate a man's mind to an astonishing degree, and in no time at all a plot was forming and unfolding in my head, a plot so superior and exciting that I began to be quite carried away at the idea of it. 
The next thing I knew, I had the telephone directory in my lap and was searching eagerly for a name. I found it, picked up the phone, and dialed the number. Hello, I said. Mr. Royden, Mr. John Royden. Well, it wasn't difficult to persuade the man to call around and see me for a moment. I had never met him, but of course he knew my name, both as an important collector of paintings and as a person of some consequence in society. I was a big fish for him to catch. At the appointed time, he was shown into my library, and I got up to meet him. He was a small, neat man with a slightly ginger goatee beard. He wore a black velvet jacket, rust-brown tie, red pullover, and black suede shoes. I shook his small, neat hand. "'Mr. Royden,' I said, "'I have a rather unusual request to make of you, "'something quite personal in its way.' "'Yes, Mr. Lampson?' "'He was sitting in the chair opposite me, "'and he cocked his head over to one side, "'quick and perky like a bird. "'Of course, I know I can trust you "'to be discreet about anything I say.' "'Oh, absolutely, Mr. Lampson. "'All right. "'Now, my proposition is this. "'There is a certain lady in town here "'whose portrait I would like you to paint. "'I very much want to possess a fine painting of her. "'But there are certain complications. "'For example, I have my own reasons "'for not wishing her to know that it is I "'who am commissioning the portrait. "'As a man of the world, I'm sure you will understand. "'Now,' "'Do you happen by any chance to know a lady called Janet de Pelagia?' "'I've heard of her. I couldn't exactly say I know her. "'That's a pity. It makes it a little more difficult. "'Do you think you could get to meet her, perhaps at a cocktail party or something like that? Oh, "'Shouldn't be too tricky, Mr. Lampson. Good. "'Because what I suggest is this.' "'that you go up to her and tell her she's the sort of model "'you've been searching for for years. "'Then ask her if she'd mind sitting for you free of charge. "'Say you'd like to do a picture of her for next year's Academy. "'I feel sure she'd be delighted to help you, and honoured, too, if I may say so. "'Then you will paint her and exhibit the picture "'and deliver it to me after the show is over. "'No one but you.' need know that I have bought it. He seemed to be hesitating, so I said quickly, I'll be glad to pay you double your usual fee. That did it. The man actually licked his lips. I should like a full-length portrait, Mr. Royden, please, and I should like her to be standing. That, to my mind, is her most graceful attitude. I quite understand, Mr. Lampson, and it'll be a pleasure to paint such a lovely lady. I expect it will, I told myself, the way you go about it, my boy, I'm quite sure it will. But I said, all right, Mr. Royden, then I'll leave it all to you. When he had gone, I forced myself to sit still and take twenty-five deep breaths. I have never in my life felt so exhilarated. My plan was working. The most difficult part was already accomplished. There would be a wait now, a long wait. The way this man painted it would take him several months to finish the picture. I now decided, on the spur of the moment, that it would be better if I were to go abroad in the interim. And that very next morning, after sending a message to Janet, with whom I was due to dine that night, telling her I had been called away, I left for Italy. There, as always, I had a delightful time, marred only by a constant nervous excitement caused by the thought of returning to the scene of action. I eventually arrived back four months later in July, on the day after the opening of the Royal Academy, and I found to my relief that everything had gone according to plan during my absence. The picture of Janet de Pelagia had been painted and hung in the exhibition, and it was already the subject of much favourable comment both by the critics and the public. When the show was over, Royden delivered the picture to my house and received his money. I immediately had it carried up to my workroom, and with mounting excitement I began to examine it closely. The man had painted her, standing up in a black evening dress, and there was a red plush sofa in the background. 
Her left hand was resting on the back of a heavy chair, also of red plush, and there was a huge crystal chandelier hanging from the ceiling. My God, I thought, what a hideous thing. Well, the portrait itself wasn't so bad. He had caught the woman's expression, the forward drop of the head, the wide blue eyes, the large, ugly, beautiful mouth with the trace of a smile in one corner. I bent forward to examine the painting of the dress. Yes, here the paint was thicker, much thicker. At this point, unable to wait another moment, I threw off my coat and prepared to go to work. I should mention here that I am myself an expert cleaner and restorer of paintings. Where my own pictures are concerned, I always do the job myself. I poured out the turpentine and added a few drops of alcohol. I dipped a small wad of cotton wool in the mixture, squeezed it out, and then gently, with a circular motion, I began to work upon the black paint of the dress. For perhaps a whole hour I worked away on this little square of black, proceeding more and more gently as I came closer to the layer below. Then a tiny pink spot appeared, and gradually it spread and spread, until the whole of my square inch was a clear, shining patch of pink. Quickly, I neutralised with pure terps. So far, so good. I knew now that the black paint could be removed without disturbing what was underneath. I worked first from the middle of her body downward, and as the lower half of her dress came away bit by bit on to my little wads of cotton wool, a queer pink undergarment began to reveal itself. I didn't for the life of me know what the thing was called, but it was a formidable apparatus constructed of what appeared to be a strong, thick, elastic material, and its purpose was apparently to contain and to compress the woman's bulging figure into a neat, streamlined shape, giving a quite false impression of slimness. Quite fantastic the whole thing seemed to me as I stepped back a pace to survey it, it gave me a strong sense of having somehow been cheated. For had I not, during all these past months, been admiring the sylph-like figure of this lady? She was a faker. No questions about it. But do many other females practice this sort of deception, I wondered? I knew, of course, that in the days of stays and corsets it was usual for ladies to strap themselves up. Yet for some reason I was under the impression that nowadays all they had to do was diet— when the whole of the lower half of the dress had come away, I immediately turned my attention to the upper portion, working my way slowly upward from the lady's middle. Here, around the midriff, there was an area of naked flesh. Then higher, upon the bosom itself, and actually containing it, I came upon a contrivance made of some heavy black material edged with frilly lace. This I knew very well was the brazier another formidable appliance upheld by an arrangement of black straps as skilfully and scientifically rigged as the supporting cables of a suspension bridge. Dear me, I thought, one lives and learns. But now, at last, the job was finished, and I stepped back again to take a final look at the picture. It was truly an astonishing sight. This woman, Janet de Pelagia, almost life-size, standing there in her underwear, in a sort of drawing-room, I suppose it was, with a great chandelier above her head and a red plush chair by her side, and she herself. This was the most disturbing part of all, looking so completely unconcerned, with the wide, placid blue eyes, the faintly smiling, ugly, beautiful mouth. Also, I noticed, was something of a shock, that she was exceedingly bow-legged, like a jockey. Now, for the next and final step. Do not imagine, simply because I have not mentioned it lately, that my thirst for revenge had in any way diminished during the last few months. On the contrary, and with the last act about to be performed, I found it hard to contain myself. That night, for example, I didn't even go to bed. You see... I couldn't wait to get the invitations out. I sat up all night preparing them and addressing the envelopes. There were twenty-two of them in all, and I wanted each to be a personal note. 
The first, the most carefully phrased, was to Janet de Pelagia. In it, I regretted not having seen her for so long. I had been abroad. It was time we got together again, etc., etc. The next was to Gladys Punsonby, then one to Lady Hermione Girdlestone, another to Princess Bicano. It was a carefully selected list, containing, as it did, the most distinguished men, the most brilliant and influential women in the top crust of our society. At 8.30, on the evening of the 22nd, my large drawing-room was filled with people. They stood about the room, admiring the pictures, drinking their martinis, talking with loud voices. Janet de Pelagia was wearing the same black dress she had used for the portrait, and every time I caught sight of her, a kind of huge bubble vision, as in those absurd cartoons, would float up above my head, and in it I would see Janet in her underclothes, the black brassiere, the pink elastic belt, the jockey's legs. Dinner was announced, and we all moved out. "'My goodness!' they cried as they entered the dining-room. "'How dark and sinister! <laughs> what divine candles! Lionel, how romantic!' There were six very thin candles set about two feet apart from each other down the centre of the long table. Their small flames made a little glow of light around the table itself, but left the rest of the room in darkness. It was an amusing arrangement, and apart from the fact that it suited my purpose well, it made a pleasant change. The guests soon settled themselves in their right places, and the meal began. For my part, I was watching the candles. They were so thin that I knew it would not be long before they burnt down to their bases. Also, I was mighty nervous, I will admit that, but at the same time intensely exhilarated, almost to the point of drunkenness. They were eating their strawberries when at last I decided the time had come. I took a deep breath, and in a loud voice I said, I'm afraid we'll have to have the lights on now. The candles are nearly finished. Mary, I called. Oh, Mary, switch on the lights, will you please? There was a moment of silence after my announcement. I heard the maid walking over to the door. Then the gentle click of the switch, and the room was flooded with a blaze of light. They all screwed up their eyes, opened them again, gazed about them. At that point, I got up from my chair and slid quietly from the room. But as I went, I saw a sight that I shall never forget as long as I live. It was Janet, with both hands in mid-air, stopped, frozen, rigid, caught in the act of gesticulating towards someone across the table. Her mouth had dropped open two inches, and she wore the surprised, not quite understanding look of a person who precisely one second before has been shot dead right through the heart. In the hall outside, I paused and listened to the beginning of the uproar, the shrill cries of the ladies and the outraged, unbelieving exclamations of the men. Then, and this was the sweetest moment of all, I heard Lord Mulherin's voice roaring above the rest. Here, someone! Hurry! Give us some water, quick! Out in the street, the chauffeur helped me into my car and soon we were away from London and bowling merrily along the Great North Road towards this, my other house, which is only ninety-five miles from town anyway. The next two days I spent in gloating. I mooned around in a dream of ecstasy. It wasn't until this morning when Gladys Punsonby called me on the phone that I suddenly came to my senses and realised I was not a hero at all but an outcast. She informed me, with what I thought was just a trace of relish, that all my old and loving friends had sworn never, never to speak to me again. Except her, she kept saying. And didn't I think it would be rather cosy if she were to come down and stay with me a few days to cheer me up? I'm afraid I was too upset by that time even to answer her politely. I put the phone down and went away to weep. Then at noon today came the final crushing blow. The post arrived, and with it 
I can hardly bring myself to write about it, I am so ashamed, came a letter, the sweetest, most tender little note imaginable, from none other than Janet de Pelagia herself. She forgave me completely, she wrote. She knew it was only a joke, and I must not listen to the horrid things other people were saying about me. Oh, what a cad, what a brute I felt when I read this! The more so when I found that she had actually sent me by the same post a small present as an added sign of her affection, a half-pound jar of my favourite food of all, fresh caviar. I can never, under any circumstances, resist good caviar. It is perhaps my greatest weakness. So, although I naturally had no appetite whatsoever for food at dinner-time this evening, I must confess I took a few spoonfuls of the stuff in an effort to console myself in my misery. It is even possible that I took a shade too much because I haven't been feeling any too chipper this last hour or so. Perhaps I ought to go up right away and get myself some bicarbonate of soda. I can easily come back and finish this later, when I'm in better trim. You know, now I come to think of it, I really do feel rather ill all of a sudden. Mrs. Bixby and the Colonel's Coat Read by Joanna Lumley Mr. and Mrs. Bixby lived in a smallish apartment in New York City. Mr. Bixby was a dentist who made an average income. Mrs. Bixby was a big, vigorous woman. Once a month, always on Friday afternoons, Mrs. Bixby would board the train at Pennsylvania Station and travel to Baltimore to visit her old aunt. She would spend the night with the aunt and return to New York on the following day. As it turned out, however, the aunt was little more than a convenient alibi for Mrs. Bixby. A gentleman, known as the Colonel, was lurking in the background, and our heroine spent the greater part of her Baltimore time in this scoundrel's company. Year after year, this pleasant alliance between Mrs. Bixby and the Colonel continued without a hitch. It was just before Christmas, and Mrs. Bixby was standing on the station in Baltimore, waiting for the train to take her back to New York. The visit which had just ended had been more than usually agreeable. The colonel had a way of making her feel she was a rather remarkable woman, and what a very different thing that was from the husband at home. "'The colonel asked me to give you this,' a voice beside her said. She turned and saw the colonel's groom. He was pushing a large, flattish cardboard box into her arms. "'Good gracious me! What is it? Was there a message?' No message, the groom said, and he walked away. As soon as she was on the train, Mrs. Bixby carried the box into the privacy of the ladies' room. How exciting this was! She started to undo the string. I'll bet it's a dress, she said aloud. I won't look. I'll just feel around and try to guess what it is. She shut her eyes tight and slowly lifted off the lid. She put one hand into the box... There was some tissue paper on top. There was also a, an envelope or a card of some sort. She ignored this and began burrowing underneath the tissue paper, the fingers reaching out delicately like tendrils. It can't be true, she cried suddenly. She opened her eyes wide and stared at the coat. Thick layers of fur made a lovely noise against the tissue paper as they unfolded, and when she held it up, and saw it hanging to its full length. It was so beautiful it took her breath away. Never had she seen mink like this before. The fur was almost pure black. Quickly she slipped off her own plain red coat. The great black coat seemed to slide onto her, almost of its own accord, like a second skin. She glanced into the mirror. It was fantastic. 
Mrs. Bixby picked up the envelope that was still lying in the box and pulled out the colonel's letter. I once heard you saying you were fond of mink, so I got you this. Please accept it as a parting gift. For my own personal reasons, I shall not be able to see you any more. Goodbye and good luck. Well, imagine that. Right out of the blue, no more colonel. She folded the letter, meaning to throw it out of the window. But in folding it, she noticed that there was something written on the other side. P.S. Just tell them that nice, generous aunt of yours gave it to you for Christmas. The man must be mad, she cried. Aunt Maud doesn't have that sort of money. She couldn't possibly give me this. But if Aunt Maud didn't give it to her, then who did? In the excitement of finding the coat and trying it on, she had completely overlooked this vital aspect. In a couple of hours, she would be in New York. Ten minutes after, she would be home, and the husband would be there to greet her, and even a man like Cyril would start asking a few questions if his wife suddenly waltzed in wearing a mink coat. But the thought of parting with it now was more than Mrs. Bixby could bear. I've got to have this coat. Two and a half hours later, Mrs. Bixby stepped off the train at Pennsylvania Station and walked to the exit. She was wearing her old red coat again and carrying the cardboard box in her arms. She signaled for a taxi. Driver, she said, would you know of a pawnbroker that's still open? Plenty along Sixth Avenue, he answered. Stop at the first one you see then, will you please? She got in and was driven away. Soon the taxi pulled up outside a shop that had three brass balls hanging over the entrance. Wait for me, Mrs. Bixby said to the driver, and she got out of the taxi and entered the shop. Mrs. Bixby stood by the counter. Yes, the proprietor said. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Bixby said as she began to untie the string around the box. Isn't it silly of me? I've gone and lost my purse, and I've got to have some money for the weekend. This is quite a valuable coat, but I only want to borrow enough on it to tide me over till Monday. Then I'll come back and redeem it. The man waited and said nothing. But when she pulled out the mink, his eyebrows went up. How about fifty dollars? I'll loan you fifty dollars. The man went over to a drawer and fetched a ticket and placed it on the counter. Name, he asked. You don't have to put the name and address to you. It's just that I'd rather not. It's purely personal, Mrs. Bixby said. You better not lose the ticket then. I won't lose it. What do you want me to put for the description? No description either, thank you. It's not necessary. Just put the amount that I'm borrowing. I think you ought to put a description. A description is always a help if you want to sell the ticket. Look, Mrs. Bixby said, I'm not broke. I simply lost my purse. At this point, an unpleasant thought struck Mrs. Bixby. Tell me something, she said. If I don't have a description of my ticket, how can I be sure you'll give me back the coat when I return? It goes in the books. But all I've got is a number, so actually you could hand me any old thing you wanted. Do you want a description or don't you? the man asked. No, she said. I'll trust you. The man wrote fifty dollars opposite the word value on both sections of the ticket. Then he tore it in half and slid the lower portion across the counter. He took his wallet from the inside pocket of his jacket and extracted five ten dollar bills. Thank you. Take good care of it. The man nodded, but said nothing. Mrs. Bixby turned and went out of the shop onto the street where the taxi was waiting. Ten minutes later, she was home. Darling, she said as she kissed her husband, did you miss me? Cyril Bixby glanced at the watch on his wrist. You're a bit late, aren't you? I know, it's those dreadful trains, she said, seating herself on the sofa. And what did you do last night? I stayed on at the office and cast a few inlays. I also got my accounts up to date. Now, really, Cyril, why doesn't that Pulteney woman do the accounts? It's part of her job, isn't it? She does do them, but I have to price everything up first. 
Mrs. Bixby opened her handbag. Oh, look, she cried, seeing the ticket. I found this on the seat of my taxi. It's got a number on it, and I thought it might be a lottery ticket or something. She handed the small piece of stiff brown paper to her husband. It's a pawn ticket. A what? A ticket from a pawnbroker. Here's the name and address of the shop. You see this figure of fifty dollars? That means that the item in question is almost certain to be something quite valuable. A pawnbroker never gives you more than about a tenth of the real value. But surely there's something to say who it belongs to. Not a thing. Then you think we can keep it? Of course we can keep it. This is now our ticket. You mean my ticket? Mrs. Bixby said firmly. My dear girl, what does it matter? The important thing is we are now in a position to redeem it any time we like for only fifty dollars. Give me the ticket and I'll rush over first thing Monday morning. I think not. I'll pick it up on my way to work. But it's my ticket. Please let me do it, Cyril. I'd rather you didn't handle it if you don't mind. But Cyril, I found it. It's mine. Whatever it is, it's mine. Isn't that right? I suppose it hasn't occurred to you that this might be something entirely masculine. In that case, I'll give it to you for Christmas," Mrs. Bixby said magnanimously. "Agreed? That sounds very fair. Why don't you come along with me when I collect it?" Mrs. Bixby was about to say yes, but caught herself just in time. She had no wish to be greeted like an old customer by the pawnbroker in her husband's presence. No," she said slowly. "It'll be even more thrilling if I stay behind and wait. Oh, Cyril, isn't it exciting? It's amusing," he said, slipping the ticket into his waistcoat pocket. Monday morning came at last, and after breakfast, Mrs. Bixby followed her husband to the door. "Are you going to have time to go to that pawnbroker?" she asked. "I forgot all about it. I'll take a cab and go there now." Darling," she said, "if it happens to be something nice, will you telephone me as soon as you get to the office? If you want me to, yes. Now I must run." About an hour later, the telephone rang. "I got it," he said. "You did? Was it something good?" "Good," he cried. "It's fantastic. You wait till you get your eyes on this." "What is it?" I want it to be a surprise. I'll bring it home with me this evening. You'll do nothing of the sort," she cried. "I'm coming right down there now. I'd rather you didn't do that. Come at one thirty while I'm having a sandwich. At half past one precisely, Mrs. Bixby arrived at Mr. Bixby's place of work. Her husband opened the door. Oh, Cyril, I'm so excited. So you should be," he said, as he led her into the surgery. Go and have your lunch, Miss Pulteney," he said to the assistant. He waited until the girl had gone. Then he walked over to a closet that he used for hanging up his clothes. Now shut your eyes. Mrs. Bixby did as she was told. She could hear him opening the cupboard door, and there was a soft swishing sound as he pulled out a garment. All right, you can look. Coyly, she raised one eyelid a fraction of an inch, just enough to give her a dark, blurry view of the man standing there holding something in the air. "Mink!" he cried. "Real mink!" At the sound of the magic words, she opened her eyes and started forward to clasp the coat in her arms. But there was no coat. There was only a ridiculous fur neck piece dangling from her husband's hand. Mrs. Bixby put her hand up to her mouth. "What's the matter, my dear? Don't you like it?" <gasps> "Why, yes," she stammered. "I, I, I think it's, it's lovely." There were two narrow, mangy-looking skins with their heads still on them, and glass beads in their eye sockets. One of them had the rear end of the other in its mouth, biting it. Here, he said, "Try it on." He leaned forward, and draped the thing around her neck. It's perfect. It really suits you. He turned away and went over to the basin, and began washing his hands. Run along now, my dear. Mrs. Bixby moved towards the door. 
I'm gonna kill that pawnbroker, she told herself. I'm gonna throw this filthy neckpiece in his face. And if he refuses to give me back my coat, I'm gonna kill him. Did I tell you I was going to be home late tonight, Cyril Bixby said. It'll probably be at least 8.30. Yes, all right. Goodbye. Mrs. Bixby went out, slamming the door behind her. At that precise moment, Miss Pulteney, the assistant, came sailing past her down the corridor. Isn't it a gorgeous day, Miss Pulteney said as she went by. There was a lilt in her walk, a whiff of perfume, and she looked just like a queen, just exactly like a queen, in the beautiful black mink coat that the colonel had given to Mrs. Bixby. Tales of the Unexpected by Roald Dahl was abridged and produced by Sarah Kilgariff and Pauline Stone and is released on audio by BBC Worldwide. Thank you.